why you already said that song. Well, I don't even should not hear what you said. Is that your last one, okay? Yeah, friend. What do we need? Uh, I have my boy's attention, please. Like to reconvene the budget hearing for the RTM for Wednesday, May 13, 2020. This is Tom Demick, moderator of the Representative Town Meeting. This is a remote special meeting of the Representative Town Meeting. There will be a roll call attendance after the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. The agenda, along with the instruction to submit public comment for this meeting, is available at www.orfct.org. A recording of this meeting will be posted at the same address along with the minutes. The meeting is open to the public via YouTube Live. Members of the representative town meeting or administration are asked to listen in the mute mode to avoid background and noise and echo. If a representative town meeting member has a question, raise your hand and you'll be acknowledged. Representative town meeting members need to identify yourselves when speaking. This conference platform has a chat feature However, the chat page will not be used for this meeting. Thank you. And like everybody, rise and slow to the flag, please. What, Joy? To apply the United States of America to the Republic for a stance, one nation under God. Thank you. At this time, the town clerk will call the roll, please. Mr. Atanasio. Here. Mr. Bono. Here. Ms. Prashali. Here. Ms. Cairns. Here. Mr. Condit. Here. Mr. Dembeck. Here. Ms. Driscoll. Mr. Driscoll? Here. Mr. Elsie? Here. Mr. Fioranti? Here. Ms. Furry Wagner? Here. Mr. Gauthier? Here. Mr. Goldstein? Here. Ms. Cole? Here. Mr. Lursch? I am here. Ms. Bativier? Here. Mr. Morgan? Here. Mr. Muckle? Here. Mr. O'Leary. Here. Mr. Olinsu. Here. Ms. Ritchie. Here. Mr. Rochetti. Here. Ms. Stewart Gelinas. Here. Mr. Swanson. Mr. Welch Collins. Here. We have a quorum, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Conklar. We'll go over the agenda for tonight. We're going to start off with uh, Department Number 10115, Zoning Board of Appeals. I think Abby Purcell is available. In fact, she's responsible for the trip. first seven budgets tonight. For the Zoning Board of Appeals, we have a total budget of $4,310, broken down as follows. Under services, $4,260. And office supplies, material, office supplies, $50. Any questions? Susan Driscoll, Andrea, I got the Susan Driscoll, I got the floor. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Hi, Abby. I know she's out there somewhere. Um, I just wanted to uh, thank you, since this is in the services subtotal. Uh, just thank you for providing the update on how the... Um, 2014 revision of the fee schedules had such positive results and you know you're pretty much covering the advertising costs and just want to say i look forward to uh, your upcoming review that you also mentioned in the budget it's good that we're looking for ways to break even whenever possible that's it anybody else have any questions of uh on the zoning part of appeals budget? No one else has any questions, we'll take it to a vote. Zoning Board of Appeals for this coming year, $4,310. All those in favor say aye. 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 aye.
Any opposed? Any abstain? The ayes have it. Thank you. <clears throat> The next budget is Department 10113, Economic Development Commission. Total budget $8,576, and it's all contained in services, which is $8,576. Questions? Paul Goldstein, you've got the floor. Yeah, um, good evening, everybody. Um, good evening, Abby. I was just wondering if you can um, give us an update um, economic development is extremely important, especially in these times, if possible, of where we stand. I know um, Kim gave us an update the other day about the grand list increasing by about 30 million. Um, can you give us an update about what's been happening with economic development and um, what's going on in the future, possibly? Can't hear her. Abby, are you there? We can't hear you. How about now? We, we got, got you. you. Thank you. Back. OK, good. Um, so there's a number of things happening relative to economic development, some of which are applications that have been ongoing for some time. Some are new proposals that may be coming forward. And then some are things that we are doing in response to the COVID pandemic that we are trying to um, support people through. So in terms of, of applications and, and things coming through right now, um, we, have had a, we have, have had a few really positive things, one of which um, was the sale and permit to reconstruct the former Toys R Us facility. Hartford Healthcare will be opening um, a fairly large medical facility at that location, and be, they'll be demolishing that building. So that'll be a great, um, not not at not at all tax exempt. So there, that'll be a great addition. We also uh, the Constitution Surgery Center just came in, um, the one up on Crossroad. They're actually expanding a little bit earlier than they originally anticipated to. It's been an incredibly popular um, place, which is great. Our one of our multifamily developments, uh, the one at 22 Minor Lane, is getting ready for certificates of occupancy. So our staff has been working closely with them um, to get folks in, and they're looking to start showing apartments um, as soon as they're able on May 20th. So we're looking at getting um, some new folks in there, and, and that's a great development, I think, to support some of the the hiring um, that we plan to see in the region over time. So we're really hoping to get more um, more things like that in. In other news, there are um, there's some interest in the airport property, and that's something that will be coming before the Planning and Zoning Commission in various phases. Um, phase one, they have submitted an application to amend the zoning in our industrial district to allow um, production of concrete uh, wall panels and, and look at doing sort of a, a, a decent sized manufacturing operation there. The zone change is sort of a step one. And if they get that approval, then they'll, they'll see where they go. So there are some large um, potential investments that, that folks are looking at in town. We continue to help folks with, um, you know, retrofitting spaces and, and commercial pieces and stuff like that as evidenced by Jollar General um, and, and that kind of stuff. So we, we really are trying to help folks through. During the current pandemic, um, a number of things have happened. Most recently, the executive order relative to outdoor dining has, has really helped us um, in terms of the enforcement aspect for zoning and being able to enable folks to take advantage of some of the um, flexibility in outdoor dining offered by the governor's office. So that's fantastic. We're also looking at doing a, a, a few other things like removing uh, liquor separation distances between restaurants so that um, some of our more antiquated separation laws don't get in the way of new businesses opening. That was one of the, um, you know, one of the things slowing down redevelopment of green survival and that kind of stuff. So we're taking a real close look at our regulations as well and, and trying to get those out of the way. And then in the meantime, there's also partnerships with New London and um, sector to, to really try to provide businesses services to navigate through loan assistance, small um, SBA programming and all that kind of stuff. So. We've got sort of a, a multi-pronged approach right now. Thank you. 
Any additional questions, Abby, on the Economic Development Commission budget coming in? No additional questions. We'll take the Economic Development Commission budget to a vote for the coming year. $8,576. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone abstaining? I believe that's unanimous. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Tom's muted. Technical difficulties, everybody. Give us one second. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. So the Conservation Commission for the years 2020-21 totals $18,550. Most of the money is in services, $17,750, and $500 in other supplies, material supplies. Any questions? Um, hold on. No hands are up. I believe I don't see anybody ask any questions. If not, I guess we'll take it to a vote. Conservation Commission, $18,250. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Anyone abstain? I abstain. Well, Dave Lursch. Dave Lursch, gotcha. Thank you. Anyone else abstain? Rich Muckle, abstain. Six buckles of stain. Got that tape. Anyone, anyone else abstain? Not. The motion passes. Thank you. Next budget on the agenda Department 10110, Planning and Zoning Commission. As a total budget for 2020 2021. Six hundred twenty-nine thousand two hundred sixty-seven dollars. First section under under discussion is personal cost five hundred sixty-nine thousand seven hundred ninety-two dollars. Any question? Adelin, so you got the floor. Uh, through you, Mr. Moderator, uh, I don't have any questions. I just have a comment. Um, Abby, um, we're really happy you're part of the town of Waterford. Uh, I've been uh, involved with the town for many years. We've seen a lot of people come and go, directors, department heads, uh, but you were a real find uh, for Waterford. And I just want to say thank you very much for wearing all the hats you do and everything you're doing for the benefit of, of the town. Thanks, Abby. Thank you, Ted. I appreciate it. No other questions on the personal cost of the budget. We'll go on to the services section of the budget, which is up to $55,260 for the Planning and Zoning Commission. Questions? No, no question. We'll go on to material supplies, totaling $3,515. Any question? Office equipment, $700. Any question? Yes. Susan Driscoll, we got the floor. 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. It's not really a question, Abby, but I just figured before we race through your budget, uh, I just wanted to acknowledge the fact that you have uh, set the bar very high, the presentation of budget backup. I think the reason that you aren't having, uh, it's, it's organized well, it's easy to understand, uh, especially for people who might not be experts in the area. I think that may be the reason there are not too many questions addressing these budgets. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. No additional questions. We'll take the Planning and Zoning Commission budget of $629,267 to a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? I believe that's unanimous. Thank you. Next budget is Department 10141, Flooding Erosion Control Board, total $2,138. Personal costs are $818. Services of $1,295. Material supplies are $25. Do I have any questions? Well, Susan Driscoll, you got the floor. Driscoll, you got the floor. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I was, I was waiting until we got to the second sub-series. I wasn't ready. Um, I do have a question uh, under services for professional fees. Uh, there was a budget in amount last year for $950. And according to the year to date through April, um, that hasn't been spent yet. So I'm trying to figure out if it was $950 intended for, on the first page of the backup, um, the study on Alewife Cove, model changes in the dune system. I'm trying to find out if that's still happening in FY20 or if the new $950 request is for that in FY21. The, the second part, um, for you, Mr. Moderator, the, um, the board, I think, has certainly made some progress in framing how they'd like to approach this project, but um, in terms of time and resources has not had an opportunity to pursue it. Um, it does require a pretty significant amount of co uh, coordination between the Flood and Erosion Control Board, uh, Recreation and Parks Commission, the Conservation Commission, and the Planning and Zoning Commission, and to date um, that, that coordination effort hasn't happened in part uh, i think we've been derailed over the last few months and some of our yeah. planning yeah. efforts have um, been you know, sort of taking a little bit of backseat so they're requesting the 950 um again to if they need any professional when, when, support when, when, to either help um get get bids out or help them the frame the problem or define back. it a little bit more I'm specifically before spending any of the thirty seven thousand dollars that rests in capital they want to make sure that the investment um will get them exactly what they want so, uh, I'm, so that's I'm listening really to the actual there. Zoom meeting. Okay. Sounds great. Thank and you. The YouTube stream sounds good too. Yeah, I've been checking. Any additional question on the flood and erosion control board budget? No. If no additional questions, we'll take it to a vote. $2,138. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Anybody abstain? The ayes have it. Thank you. The next department budget is 10118, building department. Total building department budget this coming year, 2020 $289,423. Broken down as follows on the personnel cost, you have two hundred seventy six thousand two hundred eighty five dollars. Any questions? No questions. We'll go on to services. On the services, we have ten thousand nine hundred eighty eight dollars. Any questions? Material supplies, $1,750. Questions? Comments? And the office equipment, $400. Nothing. 
total budget two hundred eighty nine thousand four hundred twenty three dollars. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Staying. I believe it's unanimous. The ayes have it. Thank you. Next budget to, for tonight is 11 Billing Department. Billing maintenance, excuse me, billing maintenance. $253,045. And the personal cost of $82,433. Any question? Susan Driscoll, you got the floor. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I have you again. So just congratulations on your new full-time facilities coordinator. I know that's been a, a long running struggle um, and it's all part of a plan to better coordinate efforts between various town bodies and prioritize preventive maintenance and regular upkeep and stop people from calling you because their light bulb burnt out. So um, it's, I know that the plan would involve an implementation uh, would involve you know, some changes in, in philosophies and procedures and some coordination, totally aware of that. So is it too soon to ask for any kind of progress report? <laughs> on, Not on too soon at all, no. We, we've had actually um, a really fantastic experience today. So David Garside was one of our building assistant building officials and he moved over into the role um, of the facilities manager and he has been an incredible incredible asset to us so far we are inc we are just so lucky to have him um he is he's really taken the bull by the horns he's doing inventories of all of our building systems reviewing all of our maintenance um contracts that we have looking at opportunities to um to to renegotiate where we can to save some money and looking really closely at what we can do in-house versus um having to hire out for so he's, he's really been fantastic. He works very closely with Rawl in the purchasing department to make sure that we're in the finance department to make sure that we are doing things according to the, the correct procedures. Um, and he's, he's really, you know, in terms of coordinating town projects, things like his work um, at the work going on down at the, the Waterford Beach, he's really just been incredible. Um, some of the things that we are doing now and that, that he is um, working on through me and, and we'll be working on transitioning that over to public works as the new fiscal year starts, um, much more reporting and, and so weekly reports in terms of his activity as well as um, a, a more consistent logging of complaints as we get them so that we can track costs and um, how, how systems are working over time, but also how uh, we are spending our time as staff so that we can, you know, sort of justify our budgets to you and make sure that we're doing the right thing. Um, and then the other piece is that Gary Schneider and I, with um, consultation with Rob Brule and Rob Avina, are going to be presenting to the, to the uh, RTM through, uh, through you, Mr. Moderator, updated language for the town ordinances to officially move the building maintenance department um, back to supervisory responsibilities under public works. Um, and that is, you know, I think everybody has talked about that being the most appropriate place um, to make sure that he also has the labor force back up and, and, and stuff to do uh, for Dave to do his job. So with that, um, there may also be some re reorganizing of department um, building maintenance, building maintenance lines and those types of things to try to consolidate things into one budget. So one facilities coordinator under the appropriate department um, with with one pot of money across all budgets to to manage things. And I think that's going to make a big difference. So things are going great. <laughs> all right. I can tell because you're smiling <laughs> very much. Thanks. I believe Sally Ritchie asked for the floor next. Sally. Thank you uh, through you, Tom. Um, Abby, I always enjoyed working with you when I was at Senior Services. Um, I appreciated there was someone I could call. Buildings end up taking up uh, administrator's time. Um, and Streaming I would have loved to have had this arrangement. Um, I had tried to uh, encourage that we have someone for many, many years. And it, it will be such an asset to the town that people that are well versed in building issues will be making the decisions. The senior services director never wanted to be the HVAC um, pro. <laughs> and while I learned a lot, it was not, I'm sure we could have done much, much better um, with having that expertise. Um, 
just along that line, my question is, if the job then moves back to public works, which it, his his position will then fall under public works. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, do you anticipate then that that might um, mean that will we still have a continued coordination with the Board of Education for all the things that they used to do for us? Do you still see that partly happening or a similar, so are we gonna do the similar kind of thing or? Mm -hmm. Is it too yeah, know? absolutely. Um, through you, Mr. Moderator, the the plan is, and what we've, I think, what we've done a good job of is is taking this time from the time in January when Dave started until now, as we prepare to move things to public works, of really crafting the program. And so we have an internal policy with the program, and we've been, we've been having a lot of conversation with Gary Schneider um, about how things work and how they might improve. But one of those things is before we go out to use private um, the private sector we offer or, or ask the Board of Education if they can assist us first um, to keep our costs down. Sometimes it's simply not possible. Sometimes our jobs are too big or they have so much work at the schools, as, as I know, Sally, you know, um, that, that it just doesn't work out and then we'll go out. Um, but for the most part, we really try to offer there first. So I think that coordination is going to is going to continue. And, and because um, you know, Dave has, has sort of started in planning and is moving over to, to DPW. And, and I think planning and DPW generally work so closely together. I think we'll be able to kind of keep tabs on that as we go. Thanks, Abby. I, I, I think it's great. Any initial questions on this personal course for bill of maintenance? If not, we'll go on to our services. On the services, we have 133,000. Six hundred twelve dollars. Question. And the material and supply, uh, supplies, other supplies, ten thousand. Any, any question on ten thousand dollars for other supplies? Not improvements. Building improvements, twenty-seven thousand dollars even. Any question? No questions. Total budget for the bill of maintenance, $253,045. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? The ayes have it. Thank you. Next budget on the agenda tonight is 10137 Recreation Parks. Recreation Parks budget for 2020-2021, broken down as follows. On the personnel cost, $1,140,230. Question. There's a dress, I got the floor. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Hi, Brian, I can't see him in front of me, but I know he's there. Good morning um, or good after evening, so. <laughs> um, my first question is about um, recreation programs, uh, which is labeled recreation program personnel on page three of the backup. Um, you know, I saw it absent uh, the inclusion of the program coordinator expense, which I can easily figure out. Um, the rest is a listing of various programs, um, which I didn't seem to find in the, I guess you'd call it the appendix, the B4 to B10, where there were cost benefit analyses. So I'm wondering how these, I'm assuming because of the title of the line item, um, the subtotals that you've provided are the cost of rec and parks personnel. So I wanna know um, first, you know, if that's true, then, then are these additional personnel or is this just allocate, you know, prorating the expenses of staff members we already have? Um, as you mentioned, Sue, uh, mm -hmm. through you, Mr. Moderator, we, we do list uh, a lot of our programming in that line. Um, as you'll see on those pages, uh, it also includes uh, beach operation employees, other seasonal employees that we have. Um, 
what you won't see there. Oh, and I, I should mention as well, uh, that includes the operations at the uh, Waterford High School pool, any swim lesson uh, instructors that we might have. What you will not see there are um, employees that are considered independent contractors. Um, we have to list them in another uh, line item. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, guys, that would be 523, uh, 52380. Um, you would find all of our uh, contracted employees that are independent contractors. But when you go into the uh, appendix uh, in the B section uh, on B1, you will see um, all of our fee-based programs we've broken out for you. Um, in, in the B section, it'll show you where we actually show you the cost of the program and the um, the revenue that's generated. And we're at about 90% of what we bring in. Um, that's our cost recovery number. So hopefully, I, Sue, I answered your question. Um, parts of it. Thank you, Brian. Um, yeah, I did know because it, it took me a while to track down the total and it goes all the way to page eight. But um, I, I could tell, you know, water safety instructors, swim instructors, I knew they weren't full time rec and park staff. You know, but I didn't know if this this was seasonal hirings. I guess what I'm looking for is I don't see most of these programs listed in those cost benefit analyses later on. So I'm trying to determine is this just the cost of personnel to work at this program? Are these free programs? You know, do we get any revenues? Some of these are free time because it's the pool. We're also, we're also open swim and lap swim at the pool is under this as well. Yes, yeah, so I was just speaking with uh, uh, Ryan McNamara. Um, some of those programs, Sue, you're going to see uh, are our pool operation employees, yep. our, our, our monitors, our lifeguards, our uh, you know, pool aquatics director. Um, so, yes, in our budget, there, there are a lot of different um, sections. Um, the way it's broken down. Um, when you go back and look at the program cost recovery, mm -hmm. um, we list our fee-based programs. So if there's a fee charge for that program, you're gonna see it in the program cost recovery. Um, but just for tax purposes, um, we have to list you know those employees that are on the payroll uh, for FICA purposes, that type of thing. Okay, so I guess, I guess you did answer part of my question, which is basically these are free programs we offer to the citizens. These listed on pages three to eight. Yes, that, that, that covers, you know, a wide variety of the programs that we do um, offer to the citizens and, and just taking a quick look through those pages. Mm -hmm. um, other than the open and the lap swims um, that 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 you will see there, um, those you know are provided at no charge uh, to our residents. But the the other programs, um, and I, I also should 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 uh, clarify that um, our community center uh, monitors are, are one that you know we we don't we don't charge a use for the community center. That was, that was from day one. Yeah. Um, so what we try to do with that program cost recovery, which the staff behind me puts a lot of work into is to give you a, a clear picture of any program that we charge a fee for, you know, this is the recovery that we're bringing back to the town. So right. roughly the town is supplementing our fee based programs by 10% um, in any given year. Okay, so I know I'm so I'm sorry I'm being dense, but there is a lot of information and it's in a bunch of different places and you know I, I I can find you know there are yoga things. So just to make sure the lap swims and, and those things you you told me are no charge, the community monitor, no charge, because somebody has to be in the building at you know, so that covers a, a litany of activities that could be happening at the same time. But but everything else listed here is no no fee 
that that is, that is correct. Uh, so th th there is, you know, if you go to just for example, um, if you're looking at the programs on the uh, top of page four, that first section, uh -huh. those are all fee-based programs. Those until, are fee-based programs. Yes, until you hit beach operations. Um, and of course we do, you know, get a good amount of revenue from uh, beach operations by the gatehouse fees and whatnot. Um, but like that, just, that's an, that's another subject altogether, Brian. Yes, that's all another, right. So yeah. so uh, yeah. So uh, the ones at the top of page four, uh, there's a fee charge. That uh, is correct. I I did see in the back pages at the end, um, you know, references to yoga classes. I don't think I saw things like cactus jack basketball or adult volleyball. Could have missed it. So you know. You can't do it right now, certainly off the top of your head, but it, it would be good for when there is a fee-based program, if you could spell out what, you know, what you collect for fees so we can compare it to these numbers, you know, the personnel costs that you shared with us. You gave us the full picture. B4 through B10. Uh, yeah, I, and, and I see what you're saying, Sue, but yep. B4 through B10 um, will show a lot, I think, of what you're asking for. It and does show a lot, but there are things like uh, bar fitness and nature play and, you know, art cooking bar that aren't in there. 2018 on B9. Yeah, and, and some of those, what will end up happening is, um, you know, since, since the budget we look at it as a, um, you know, planning document as best we can. Uh -huh. um, you know, if, if I could predict the future, I, I wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> um, but uh, um, all kidding aside, sometimes those programs, we try to group them into adult programs, um, aquatic type programs. But what we've seen over the years, if we have interest from, from, from the residents on a certain type of program, um, that's where it gets, I think, complicated. I see exactly what you're saying. We, yeah. we have to offer a, a program under a different name. Mm -hmm. um, so when we plan the budget a year out, that program that we thought might be popular doesn't mm -hmm. meet the minimum attendance. Right. And then we drop it. And then we, we only run programs if they break even or better. So ho hopefully that clarifies it. Uh, a little bit. And if, but if, if you could, because I know budget preparation is, is just an incredible amount of work and you have so many varied programs and things floating around and many with similar names. If, if you could present, take all the programs that are, that require a fee to participate. And if you want to lump them as all, you know, aquatic or pool related or whatever and do that, to make it easier for you, that's fine. As long as we can see that there's a program that we charge a fee, here are the costs, you know, and here's the revenue. So we can see the same cost benefit analysis that that was very helpful on B4, B10. And actually made me flip all the way back to look at this again and go, oh, wait a minute. I didn't notice these things in there. And that's why I asked the question. I mean, because Cost benefit analysis is the best thing you can give us, I think. The clearest. And like I said, if you want to group it by pool and the one ballet class or whatever, that's okay. Whatever is easiest for your based on your record keeping. But if we could have all the fee based programs, a cost benefit analysis together in the appendix, that would really give us a clearer picture of the activity that's going on. We we do so, so with all due respect, we, we do list every program, um, you know, going back so many years, any fee-based based program that we offer um, will, will be in that backup, you know. You know, if there's a specific class, we could take a look at that for you. Three years ago. Um, but, but just so you know, obviously, we're basing, you know, the, this report is based on eat it. prior said, year budgets just where the fine. programming like, classes may have changed somewhat. I said, soon you'll be um, off so the it's kind of hard to marry up the, the program cost just, recovery with the current year budget. 
Mm -hmm. um, but we do list every fee-based program in, in that cost recovery report to the best of our ability. Okay, and, and like I said, flipping back and forth, I may have missed, you know, I couldn't find the bar fit, and now I see it because I'm asking you, but if I understand some of this is predictive for your budget in the pro, in the page three section, even if, if, if you just flag it and say, you know, planned for FY21 so you don't have the numbers, it would just, it would just be helpful. Right. We, we, we will do our best to, you know, make it as, as clear as possible because I know that program's on B9. You know, once again, I know you guys have a lot of paper in front of you, a lot of numbers in front of you. <laughs> yeah. In any way we can make it um, easier uh, to, to comprehend, we'll, we'll do our best. But just, just so everyone knows, we're very cognizant of if a program doesn't meet that minimum to cover the instructor costs, you know, we most of the time we'll drop that program unless it's like a new program that we're trying to launch so we're very, very cognizant of that okay and, I, and and i'd like to make it clear i'm not earmarking any specific program based on the employee cost i was just trying to clarify in my mind what the numbers meant and where they were so. sure just the space all set so yep thank you I, I I forgot that I was supposed to call in the first selectman. No, no, we can read it. Oh, well, I'm gonna read a no, I think. Uh, all right. Before I start this budget, I, I forgot. I apologize. He's gonna take over the microphone just for a minute, and then the mic bono has got the floor after that. Mr. Brol. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, and. Sorry to just interrupt, but I, I was given a, a letter to read and I surmised it. It's from Danny Gorman and it has to do with uh, recreation and parks. I summarized the letter. You will all be getting the full letter uh, from Danny Gorman. I want to take a moment to extend our gratitude to the first selectmen and other town departments who have stood beside us as we reoriented ourselves to exclusively feeding the hungry during this crisis. I specifically express my gratitude to the parks crew of the Recreation and Parks Department who have packed, loaded, transported, and unloaded food products on our behalf several times a week. Their commitment to the interfaith food locker and the needs of our residents has been extraordinary. Um, you will receive that. That's from Danny Gorman. She wanted to make sure that I, I noted uh, these uh, team players for Recreation and Parks, helping them out so much over the past six weeks. So thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Roll. And now the floor is Mike Bono's turn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. And thank you, uh, Mr. Brule, for that uh, letter. Um, I'm going to take us away from um, the programming questioning for a moment here, although I see some colleagues after me that I'm sure have some follow-ups. And I'm going to ask a question uh, surrounding the overtime line item. So uh, on page 9, uh, Five one eight one zero. Um, hey, hey, Dave, who's after Mike? There's some uh, justification in some of the uh, overtime line items. For example, in winter, there's snow removal placed. Um, in October, the Harvest huh? Festival is named. Um, I just have kind of a, a, a philosophical question for you and your department, um, and then kind of a more uh, logistical, practical uh, question um, for you. So my main question is the, you know, your philosophy is what is the principal driver of the overtime in your department? Um, and then what specifically is the overtime that is performed in say like the summer, fall 2020, where there's not much justification there? Um, thank you. Uh, sure. Uh, to answer your question uh, through you, Mr. Moderator, um, the the overtime, a bulk of our programming is due to the, the, the labor contracts currently enforced uh, in town. Uh, so, for example, our, our maintainers work uh, 630 to 3 shift uh, Monday through Friday. Uh, any work on the weekends, as we're a recreational parks department, as I'm, I'm sure you all realize, 
we have a lot of activities that occur on weekends. So if they come in on a weekend to work, um, their contract uh, at this point in time, um, basically they have to be paid that overtime rate. Um, for, you know, obviously the summer, you could just imagine, you know, between the beaches, the parks, you know, COVID 19s have, have changed things a little bit, um, but the ball fields and whatnot. To your point about the fall, um, we do, uh, you know, continue to um, take care of the, um, the fall sports and the parks are still open. So we have to get to the bathrooms and to the trash uh, throughout the town. Um, so we pretty much, you could, if you, if you know, you, you run most of the year, um, with, with an overtime budget, uh, some years you have a cost savings, for example, this year, um, I don't think it snowed once. Um, so we, we, we do put some funds away for snow removal since we're responsible for town, uh, buildings and parks with the snow removal. Um, but we do have a list of what the maintainers need to accomplish each time they go out on an overtime day, be it a Saturday, a Sunday, a holiday, or an emergency call out. I uh, hope, hope that answered your question. If not, please. Uh, ju please yeah, just a know. quick follow up, Mr. Moderator. Um, it seems like in July, like the, those summer months, that most Saturdays and Sundays have overtime associated with that. Um, I was wondering what, what is the, like, what's the, uh, trigger that like starts the ball rolling for, I need to call someone in to, for overtime this Saturday or this Sunday. What is there like a, a triggering event or a scheduled event at a, at a facility or, um, someplace in town that would, you know, require that overtime? Um, uh, through you, Mr. Moderator, the, the, to answer your question, it, it is scheduled weekly uh, throughout the, um, the summer. Um, we, we, the main um, concern is the, the beach maintenance. Um, you know, we, we check the bathrooms down there. Um, we, we groom the waterfront. We, we take care of any ball fields that, that need prepped. And we have roughly 20 uh, properties in town that we're responsible for, uh, some of those being Board of Ed properties. And, you know, we basically take a run through each of those, uh, checking for trash. For example, if there's a, you know, a game that's scheduled, um, we also have to prep that field, um, say in the summer, something we would take care of the infield, um, that type of thing. Next day, there could be a game on Sunday. We do the same thing. We have to prep the field again. Uh, so the summer, every weekend, uh, you can count on, we have to go, you know, through the schedule um, for beaches, parks, and ball fields. Gotcha. And, and one last follow-up, Mr. Moderator, if I may. Sure, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, so let's say we have, so I'm just going to kind of surmise what an overtime shift might be. A uh, maintainer shows up. They report to Waterford Beach. They take care of the beach and groom the beach. They check the um, trash cans. They clean the bathroom facilities. Um, then let's say there's a baseball game scheduled at Leary Park. They drive up to Leary Park. They um, drag the infield. They line the field. They clean out the trash cans there. They go through Leary Park, clean out trash cans. Gotcha. Um, what teams are playing at Leary Park or Waterford High School or any field in town, um, are they town teams? Um, if they are town teams, um, what are they paying to use the field? If they're not town teams, what are they paying to use the field? Thank you. Right. I, I don't know if you heard uh, Ms. Sullivan, but uh, we, we do, if, if it's a town co-sponsored organization that's on the field, uh, there is no charge. If it is an out of town organization, it's, it's a $95 charge to prep and line the field, which they have to coordinate through our office ahead of time. Um, just to note as well, um, 
a lot of these weekends we we bring in at least two individuals you know to cover 20 sites um as as a budgetary concern that i have um you know we're paying you know three hours overtime at a minimum you know that's a contracted uh established rate so they literally have to go from the south of town to the north of town hit all those trash cans in several parks groom the beach prepare the beach for the day um so a lot of days you know they barely get that work done within that three hour time frame but we do you know as i mentioned we do charge a different rate um you know for for, for an out-of-town rental you know they are paying a premium rate for that field to help compensate for that overtime fee that we have to pay our our staff Hope that answers your question. Thank you. Yeah, it does. It just seems that $95 would just be helping to defray the cost instead of totally covering the cost in my estimation. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. That concludes my question. Thank you, Mr. Bono. I think Mr. Michael has the floor next. Mr. Michael. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Brian, just a comment. First of all, uh, your uh, department, Recreation and Parks, is one of seven agencies that make up the general government budget that came in at or lower than or at the same uh, budgetary amount as last year and uh, I want to recognize you and the other folks for that effort. Um, my question however is kind of disturbing because um, I think we've talked about this uh, in the past. Youth swim lessons consistently shows a loss and not only this year uh, but if I you go back a number of years, three, four years, the total of that loss is approximately $45,000. What can we do to fix that problem? And we've, we've discussed it before, and uh, I know that there may be some unique issues there, but in my estimation, we're not at a point in the budget or in our finances with the town that we can afford a cumulative loss of nearly $50,000. Um, over the course of the, of the three year period, and thank you for your first comment, um, uh, Mr. Michael, but with, with, with swim lessons, yes, it, it, it does stick out like a sore thumb. Um, you know, I, I have to say it is factored in, you know, to that, that 90% uh, backup information you see in the program cost recovery report. Um, we feel strongly, I know, and I, I think I could very, uh, for our staff and our commission, um, and I, I know a lot of you realize this, but, you know, we, we are a, a, a community that is, you know, surrounded by water on, on most of our borders other than the north. And, you know, we feel that's one program that is, is, is really essential um, you know, for the safety of the children and the families. And we have adults that take the swim lessons as well. Um, and we've looked at that. We, we've looked at the costs. Um, you know, we've looked at tweaking those fees. But as, as um, our program coordinator reminded me, we had this discussion the other day that a lot of the times we'll have a family that'll have two or three children that'll be in that class at the same time. And you start adding up those figures, um, it gets quite expensive. And, and we obviously don't want to exclude anyone from learning how to swim. Um, so it would be difficult to break even on that program, um, you know, without, you know, charging a very large fee. And, you know, I, I do, I, I do, I, I, I respect what you're saying. Um, but we would, you know, most definitely take a look at that. And, and see what we can do. Uh, one thing we can't do is, is to reduce the staff. Um, each one of those sessions, and I'm sure a lot of you have had, you know, children, grandchildren, maybe if you've been in them yourselves, um, we've, um, you know, we have a program that, that's respected in, in, in this part of the state um, by way of, we have a water safety instructor supervising each session. We have an Thank aquatics you. director supervising it. We have one-on-ones in the water with the younger kids, so it's it's a very difficult program to to break even on in the in the type of 
uh, format that we're, we're in at this point. Hopefully, Mr. Muckle, that answers your question. Well, it does to some respect, Ryan, but still, you know, again, in the economic uh, life that we live in this, these times, it's difficult to go through a budget and see over a course of years where there's a $50,000 loss. You know, if it's several thousand dollars, three, four thousand dollars over those that period of time, that's one thing. But uh, I'm sure there are, there are agencies in town that would love to have $50,000 more in their budget. And again, I recognize what you're saying. I recognize the family situation. But I think if you look to our neighbors and some of the the towns that offer similar services, you'll find that they are significantly more than what we we operate at with a loss. Yes, and, and we're happy to revisit that uh, to see if there's any way we can do cost savings. Um, you know, tweak the fees a bit. You know, we most most happily will will take a look at that. Thank you. Please, Sally Richie has the floor next, Sally. Brian, thank you for your budget. Um, I just, I have more of a global kind of big picture question. And if you can't answer, I mean, I did send an email about it. I know you're in the thick of a lot of things right now. So I understand, um, you know, that you couldn't get back to me, but I think you'll recall uh, about 10 years ago, the town spent a quite a bit of money to have a long range plan to restrain budgetary growth. And the consultants at that time really recommended that we consider running fee based programs out of a special revenue fund so that the there be no impact to the taxpayer. Um, the programs would either recoup enough to cover the cost or they wouldn't exist. Really popular programs might actually make some money, which then could help you, and this would apply to senior services as well, um, would help you to offer new programs or try out some programs. It, essentially a revolving account. I think everyone is aware that the expense comes out and then the money goes back to the general fund. Um, if, if, if they were directly offsetting costs with the fees from programs do you think we do, do you think that's something we can look at again or or if not can you tell me um how that would hinder operations no i'd be happy to sally um you know that that's something we've looked at you know we, we do meet with other um uh, recreational parks departments to see what they're doing and you, and you nailed it. It's a, it's a philosophy point. Um, you know, we do, uh, as a taxpayer myself, um, we do pay taxes into this town and we do expect, I think, speaking for Joe Jane taxpayer, uh, some services to be provided at either a reduced or at a no cost basis. Um, so that when you go into those special revenue accounts, you know, We've, we've watched them for years. Um, we've had Board of Finances in the past. I've been reminded that are, are, are leery of them at times. Um, we are essentially um, a, a not-for-profit agency. Um, so, so we need to be careful there. Um, if, if we start some of these, and, and quite honestly, I've seen some departments, I won't name them uh, in other towns, you know, they end up generating a large profit. And then what do you do with that cost? It's almost the old argument of double taxation. Well, I've been charged taxes and now I'm being charged the fee for a program. Um, and in, in speaking as myself as a taxpayer, I, I don't think that is um, something um, that's easily accomplished. You know, we will look, I'd be happy to look into it again, but we'd have to work very closely with the commission Right. Uh, the finance director, the first selectman, um, because quite honestly, I've seen these go in the wrong direction. You know, my philosophy is we're a, a human service agency and there should be some things provided uh, without costs since taxes are, are involved. Yeah, it's sort of a double-edged sword because if we really knew, and I mean, we could easily figure it out, 
but the percentage of residents who avail themselves of programs. Um, I mean, I worked, you know, I heard from so many seniors, oh, I never go to the center. I'm, I'm not old enough. I'm never going. They were 90 years old. They never used the community center facility. It was available to them, but they didn't choose to uh, use it. Um, what happens then is whether you use it or not, you're paying the tax on it. And I mean, government is set up to, you know, to care for all, and I understand that, and, and all government is service. Um, but it's just, I just wonder if it's something we could look at again. I, I, I'm very aware that we do not want to be in competition with businesses in town that are gyms, et cetera. That's why we don't have a huge fitness center that would rival, you know, the, the gyms in town. So I understand that part of it. Thank you. I'm um, just one other really, well, I hope it's quick. Maybe it's impossible. But as we look at these budgets, we've been thinking about the virus and thinking about the viability of, of programs in the summer. Um, if you had to give a gut response right now, do you think, think things like playground is going to happen this summer? I know we don't have any Thing from the governor yet we have things on zoos, hairstyling, uh, eating outdoors, but we don't have anything yet on parks. I don't believe. No, good point, and, and thank you. So we'll continue to look into the fee-based, you know, program analysis. Or uh, as far as far as the playgrounds and other summer programs, um, yeah, as you could imagine, you know, we're discussing that daily with, with, with my staff. Um, we've had very good uh, cooperation and support from the first selectman's office, uh, the emergency management director's office, the uh, police department, as well as a ledge light health district. Um, we've been on Zoom and conference calls with council of governments, um, as, as, as well as other recreation and park agencies throughout the state. I wish I could give you an answer. You know, at this point in time, um, we're seeing a lot of caution um, on what to start back. Um, you know, we obviously don't want to, to lose any ground here. Um, I don't have to tell you how serious this pandemic is, um, but we next week um, on May 20th, we're expecting some more guidance um, from the governor's office. Um, there's some standards that are being put in place that you have to meet in order to run a summer camp playground type program. And um, I, I know the first selectman is, is very involved in, in that day-to-day -day planning. I'm involved to it, you know, to it myself. But right now, Sally, I'm sorry, I, I can't give you an answer if, if they're gonna run or if they're not at this point in time. And Brian, I didn't really expect an answer, but <laughs> just rather that it, it, it's sort of in the mix of all the decisions that we're making on many of the budgets. But thank you so much. No, no, thank you. This is one the floor is yours now. Mim, you're on mute right now. Sorry, gang. Um, Brian, thank you. And thank your staff for um, helping out uh, with Danny Gorman. That was wonderful. Um, Brian, my question goes back to Mr. Bono's question. Um, it, it looks like, on paper anyway, um, that you have seven maintainers, park maintainers, and two part-time in the summer. Is that correct? Uh, that, that is correct. We do have a vacancy now. We had someone um, resign and take another position. So uh, at all times, uh, we're, we're down to six maintainers. And we, at this point, haven't hired the seasonal maintainers since there's a hiring freeze in town. Uh, typically, we do hire two for the summer season. Oh, well, that's what your budget indicates. So thank you. So my, my question is, you, you were very explicit about what they do maybe on a weekend. And we certainly know there's plenty of things to do in the summer, but seven maintainers in the winter, and especially a lot of your things like loam and fertilizing and 
Um, other things are service contracted. So I'd really kind of like to have an idea of what a maintainer does, seven maintainers do in December if there's no snow. Um, and we do, uh, that, that's a fair question. Um, we, we basically look at it this way from March and through, Nove through November of any, any year. Um, we are, you know, basically mowing grass, trimming, um, we're, we're prepping ball fields, we're doing turf management, we're doing the trash runs, the bathroom runs, that type of thing. And, and, and believe me, we've had people ask us, well, what do they do in the winter? Um, what, not to give you a history lesson, but when I started here, we had 12 maintainers, 12 plus. Yeah. And um, now we're down to seven, um, you know, without a foreman. We, we do have the assistant director stepping into that role now. Um, so what they do in the winter to answer that question is we keep them out as often as we can. If there's no snow, uh, that gives us time. For example, this last winter, um, we built a new gatehouse. Um, we, we work on dune fencing at the beach. We get to, to trail maintenance that if you look at the plan of conservation and development, a lot of residents want more trails in this town. They have for many years. Uh, so we get out there, we do the trail maintenance, equipment maintenance. Um, we do have the supplemental, thank you, Carrie. We do have the supplemental um, firewood program, you know, for seniors. We're even opening that up a little bit. If, if someone needs heat related assistance through our, our uh, supplemental wood program, we will um, make exceptions. They don't need to be a senior. If they can show us the need, they'll get the wood delivered. Um, so if you look at it, once again, March through November is, is a typically very busy time. You're slamming, right. December, January, February, um, you know, we, we do, we have two shops and, and, and they do, they do keep, we, we do keep busy. And if the weather cooperates as last winter, it really cooperated. Um, we, we were responsible for a lot of tree maintenance in the town too, working with the public works department. So that gives us time to take out hazardous trees, that type of thing. Thank you, Brian. Uh, just a follow-up. Um, the library obviously is open on the weekends and the schools have custodians that work nights and weekends. So I, I, I realize that I you're facing a, you know, a union defined position, um, but I think you the next time around, you have to start looking at uh, defining your work day so that you can have uh, some folks start later in the day and work into the evening in the summer um, and some have Monday and Tuesday off and work uh, Wednesday through Sunday. Certainly your part-timers, you shouldn't be getting overtime for them on the weekends. So um, I agree, the, uh, you have to reconstruct the language of those contracts because if not, we're gonna get hit with overtime where you could basically hire another person who's not unionized and have that person work um, the holidays and the weekends. Thank you. No, no good point. Thank you. David Lewis, you got the floor next. David. Oh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, through the moderator, please, I'd like to ask a couple questions. Um, I, I noticed that uh, you provided uh, very nice specificity on the uh, number of uh, individuals who work at minimum wage or a little bit above that and um, how many hours they work. Um, and it appears, at least from the budget, that you're following the uh, the guidelines as set by the state for the uh, gradual increase in the um, uh, minimum wage. I um, also noticed that that you reduce the number of summer jobs for minors um, uh, to the tune of oh, about almost seven thousand dollars. Did the uh, reduction that we show there is is that a function of the uh, increase in minimum mandatory minimum wage um and the second question i have is is, is um in the future do you see the continual increases in minimum wage to 15 dollars an hour as impacting you as either uh, reducing staff uh, reducing programs rate increases or other offsets um you know, no, good question, um, Mr. Moderator. We, 
I'll start with the summer fo job for minors program. Um, you know, we were um, asked, you know, by uh, Mr. Brule, the first selectman, you know, to uh, bring our budget at a zero percent increase. And so one of the the places we thought with this fiscal year, um, we, we could reduce the summer job for minors program. Um, so that's where you see the decrease there. Uh, that was one spot where we thought it would be fair. You know, as much as I love the program, been involved with it for over 20 years, uh, we understand the times. And um, we, we thought that would be an appropriate place uh, to, to, to make a reduction to come in at the 0% increase. Um, to your second point, um, yes, um, you know, especially in, in, in current events, you know, we're looking at um, our staff, um, especially our part-time staff, our seasonal staff, and in the future where we can make reductions, we will. One thing we also did to, to get to that 0% increase is we cut the hours of our seasonal maintainers. Uh, they typically work longer um, in the budget pr presented before you tonight. Um, we cut them pretty drastically, um, the amount of hours that they typically work. And, and, we, and we're going to continue to do our best, um, you know, without, you know, uh, sacrificing the services we provide to the community, which we feel strongly about. Um, but we will continue to take a look at that. Um, thank you for uh, thank you for that answer. Um, as you cut back on services, I I guess that will probably be advised somehow in future budget uh, um, proposals of how those services are impacted. Uh, thank you, sir. I don't have any more questions. Thank you. I believe Susan Driscoll got the floor next. Susan Driscoll, you have the floor. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, it's just that I, I know that other people were waiting in line before me, so I, I would happily step aside and let them go first. No, you were not. Susan, you were next on the list. Okay, but I've been looking at their hands for <laughs> the past five minutes. All right, so at the risk of uh, beating a dead horse, Brian, for, uh, but since we've already skipped down to the programs, which is in a separate series than the recreation programs personnel, I guess my first question is, since you explained to me that the recreation program personnel, those are the costs associated with the fee programs that are covered in B4, B10, I've been finding more of them. Um, so my question is, since we have the cost, which seems to be a breakout from whatever fees were mentioned earlier when I can find them, and we have the loss, and I'm not going to point at any specific program because there is always someone who that's their favorite program. But we have entries sometimes where obviously somebody had a problem with the spreadsheet where it says the cost is volunteers, which I assume means free. Revenue is 257 and the loss is 257 or you know, sometimes they don't add up. But here's the big question. If the cost of the programs is attributed to the personnel cost, which is in one light item, then why do we have entries in program programs and co-sponsored programs which cover things that were in the first section why do we have additional um dollar requests for those are those additional expenses that aren't accounted for in this cost revenue analysis on b4 b10 um, yeah through, through you should find those there i was just checking with the staff on that um what we have to do, and I, I wish we could present it where it would be a little bit more uh, uh, clear cut, but any contracted employee, uh, independent contractor, we need to list in the line item 52380. 
if it's a employee that we consider a bona fide employee, um, they're listed in 51620. Um, you know, and, that, and that's something, you know, beyond our control, um, you know, due to tax law, obviously. Um, you know, anyone in 51620, the taxes are automatically taken out. They don't own their own business. They don't consider, we're, we don't consider them an independent contractor. 52380. They, they are independent contractors and they're responsible for, you know, pr providing to the IRS, you know, what they're earning. Uh, so they're taxed appropriately. Um, and no, I, I can follow that, Brian. Thank you very much. Because that actually was my job was to explain to employers how to do that. Um, but can you, and I hate to put you on the spot, give me an example of one of these programs that has an independent contractor rather than an employee who is covered in the line item way at the top. Zoom is a good one. Open as we have an employee, Zoom but we have an independent contractor. Yes. Zoom is an independent contractor. We have four. Okay, here's a, here's an example um, for for Zumba. Uh huh. If we're looking, I'm on I'm on B10 for example. Oh so my. Uh, so we had the, the 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 cost there, as you can see, the revenue that came in. Mm -hmm. And we actually had uh, you know, made seventy two dollars to the good. Um, mm -hmm. That instructor is independent is an independent contractor. Um, if we if we go right above uh, to our youth yoga instructor, mm -hmm. that is someone that we have on the payroll. Um, so as you can see there, we're still to the good uh, fifty fifty four dollars. Now of course you're going to see some some, some red in those programs as well mm -hmm. um so it, it it all breaks down hopefully sue i answered your question it all breaks down to to wherever they they fall in that in that criteria uh, any given year it's kind of hard for us to, to to determine that i mean we do our best um to to figure out how many independent contractors we're going to have versus how many uh paid staff we're going to have um, seasonal staff and it varies year to year. Sure. Okay. So a follow up, if you don't mind. Um, I was just trying to figure out, based on your explanation earlier, you know, were there additional costs when I thought those were the total costs at the beginning? So independent contractor, I understand that. Um, if there could be a note somewhere, because you know, maybe that's why I didn't find Zumba in the first part, but it's not obvious just trying to save you from us asking the same stupid questions next year um as far as the co-sponsored programs which i would guess would be men's softball something like that uh and, and point three mr Meyer, point well taken we you know we'll do our best to 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 note you know the independent contractors versus the the, the employees in, in future reports um as far as men's softball, that is a, a recreational program where, where the co-sponsored differences would be on, on page 14. Um, those are the, most of them are youth sport organizations um, from your little leagues to, to, to football cheerleading, um, you know, to the community band, which is an all age co-sponsored program. You know, that money is, is given to them um, to help them run their program. Uh, to offset their fees, as, as many of you, and I know s several of you have been involved with the co-sponsor programs, you can see that money that we're, we give them only covers probably a very small part of their budget. Um, and so that's more or less the support we give. We also give support through the Youth Support Council uh, that the assistant director works on, um, you know, through our staff. So um, we feel the best, um, you know, criteria for, for giving youth a, a good uh, beneficial uh, sport experience uh, is, is given. So there is that, the co-sponsored in the, in the regular programs, I'm sorry for the long answer, but that, that is the reason uh, they're separated. Um, nope, that's okay. I, I like that they're separated and no apologies for a long answer because I'm pretty sure at least one of my sentences was longer than that answer. Um, so Mike, so my question, just to make sure I followed it, co-sponsored programs, this reflects 
money we give to the American Legion or the Babe Ruth group um, to help them pay what fees? That, that, that's correct, Sue. That, that is a, a lot of that. Um, and it, it is uh, a vetted out process. Um, each year they have to provide us a, a complete, um, we, we ask them to fill out an application that we ask for their bank statements. We ask, you know, how they're spending the money uh, that they give us. A lot of it goes to insurance. Um, a lot of it goes to uh, the, the different official fees. Um, a lot of it is going to their uh, field maintenance, those type of things. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So one thing we, the, the commission and staff are very clear on though, is we don't want to support um, all-star uh, teams or trophies. We feel that that someone else should be, should be doing that. We should be providing the basic, the introductory level sports. Um, you know, the, the old, everyone can play, um, you know, mentality. Mm -hmm. um, so, but just so, so everyone on the RTM knows, they do have to fill out that report each year. And if they ask for an increase from the prior year ask, um, they have to appear before the commission to justify that. So we review those ports right prior to budget season each year. Okay, follow up, please. Um, okay, so this is money, this total, the 41,549 is not attributable to any of our programs listed elsewhere because it's the co-sponsored programs and you said we, meaning the town, gives these groups all notable, recognizable, and you know, respected groups, give them this money to help with their fees. So my question is, what fees? Fees that the town charges them or fees to another organization so that they can, you know, play against other teams or whatever. I'm trying to figure out what that money's for. Yeah, that, that, a lot of that money would, would, would be the actual equipment, you know, looking at the uniforms that the participants would have. Um, you know, we obviously don't charge them any fees, you know, for, for using, say, you know, Leary Park, the fields on, on Gardner's Wood Road uh, that we have the arrangement with, um, you know, Dominion Resources. Um, so those fees are, and I have to give credit to a lot of the co-sponsor organizations, you know, through their concession stands, through their fundraising drives, they do raise a lot of, of, of those um, fees to, to, to operate. But, you know, a lot of it's insurance. A lot of it is, the, as I mentioned, material supplies, um, uniforms, um, umpire fees. And, and as I said, we're very careful. We're always careful that this is, you know, to include everyone. We, you know, we, we, we make it very clear to them. They each have to have a representative on the sport council and they have to follow national guidelines, um, you know, to make sure every child has an opportunity to play. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that answers your question. It, and we do get very detailed reports, the co-sponsored organizations um, provide that uh, in good detail to us. Okay, and, and follow up again. I'm sorry. Um, Susan, I one more question. I got other people waiting in line. Uh, yeah, that's why I'd offered to go last. Uh, just again. All right. So this is co-sponsor programs. They do. The, I, I have no issue. I'm not taking any issue with, you know, the groups we co-sponsor with. I was just trying to understand the concept. You know, I mean, because these all report all the bold numbers mean money we are paying. So I just wanted to know where it was going. And if it was, we were subsidizing fees, we had charged them, which you explained, we did not. So again, not checking it. Um, I would just like to reiterate uh, one last time. Um, I'm glad you said you do a cost benefit analysis on all these programs. You know, if it's not making money, then you take it out. Although it seems from, because you gave us several years that there are some continued. I, I would strongly encourage you, you know, based on the comments made so far um, by my colleagues, 
that you really do take a closer look at these cost-benefit analyses. Um, we're not asking you to make a profit. Breaking it, break even is fine. Um, but there comes a point where the ones that are really making money are subsidizing the others, so the break even is is illusory at best. Um, I think we would prefer to see you spend less money. You still have great variety of programs, but maybe offer one or two less and spend less money up front and still break even to have the same result. So it's just small economies. I know you've got some big numbers going all the way through your budget, but you know, we appreciate every effort. Thank you. And for Carly, the floor is yours next. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Hi, Brian. Um, I, I actually have only have a couple of comments. First off, um, Miriam, I can tell you what two of the guys did in the winter, which was help me and a couple of volunteers decorate the town green. The two guys that helped me, there's no way I could have done it without them. They were fantastic to work with, two of the most professional, helpful, hardworking guys I've ever worked with. I don't know what they make, which ones they were, but they were priceless. And it seemed to be very popular that the town green was finally decorated after, I don't know, 40, 50 years. So um, that was my one. <laughs> I also think that the, um, as far as the parks go, our parks and beaches are one of the only big things we have going for us right now. So I think they should look impeccable. I don't want to see trash. So how we make that work, we'll make it work. My other thing I, wouldn't have added until you said it was I did not realize that they distributed wood to seniors. Um, I was a recreational therapist uh, for years between Bayview and Hillcrest in Norwich. Um, I choose to advocate a lot for the seniors. I feel like they're a forgotten generation and they have a lot to add. Um, I think they pay a lot of the backspace in the town and a lot of them don't use the services because a lot of them can't leave their house. Um, I'd like to see more services provided and I'm not necessarily saying anything that would require money because I've often felt like some of the LTS hours with the students could be better spent than work in the stand at the ball field. Sorry if I offend anyone. Um, I know that I think it was I think it was Mr. Walker once when there was a, Mr. Sutton, when there was a snowstorm, had his boys out shoveling seniors' driveways. Now, as a member of Waterford Ambulance, an EMT, if you can't get to somebody's drive, you know, walkway or driveway, it, when the ambulance comes, you can't get in. And a lot of times you need to get them out on a stretcher or a stair chair. So, it wouldn't be a bad idea to have a program like that, maybe where the kids could get hours, or maybe the kids could just come interact with the seniors more, because I really do feel like they have a lot to offer. And even if that means going, we set up something where they go to one of their houses and sit with them for an hour. They can come sit here, because I have two seniors that live with me right now. So, <laughs> um, regardless, I know, um, they do use your pickleball courts, though, because I've heard from my senior friends about the pickleball courts. But um, regardless, I just um, wanted to give some good input about those guys. I can't remember their names because I'm not good with that, but they are fantastic, and I hope I see them next next uh, holiday season. Thank you. No, through you, Ms. Roder, thank you, and, and, and we, we will – uh, continue efforts working with with, with uh, senior services on, as well as youth services and other departments on you know taking care of our seniors, which are vital in this town. But thank you. If you need me, I'm willing to volunteer to help get something together. Just give me a call because I, I love my seniors. <laughs> Appreciate that. I don't get there yet, but I do. <laughs> Greg, you got the floor next. Uh, through you, Mr. Moderator. How you doing, Brian? Um, Good. Good evening. So I I was looking through here. I'm looking at page 13, special events. That's um, that's in your budget for programming. Is that correct? Am I understanding that right? Yes, that's correct. Um, have any of those events already kind of come to pass? Um, and, and they are factored into this year's budget? 
Um, you know, these are events, you know, we, we hope to conduct, you know, after obviously after July 1, I'm um, taking a quick look through the special events, you know, like the Pearl Harbor Day road race is in December. Yeah. yeah. You know, the triathlon, you know, they, they go th throughout, you know, of course, the, um, uh, the tree lightings, we had to cancel the Easter egg hunt, you know, this year, we're hoping to have it next year. Um, but we, we do use that as, as a planning tool. Um, our concert series is in that is is in that section as well. Okay, I was just curious where we, we stood with everything as we move into this. Um, I, I saw another thing in here too with fees uh, for use of the schools. Um, I was trying to find out where the revenue might be on that. Uh, so the any any revenue from our uh, school rentals, which which go through our department, right. um, go to the community use of school, you know, revenue account, um, and, and and so that's a you know fees obviously they're set, um, all of that um, you know once once the school approves a rental, it goes right you know into that that line item, and that that that's through your budget. I'm just trying to figure out where I can find that. Uh, that would be un under community use of schools. So where you see, I, I see your point where, where you see where we're bringing in revenue from uh, some school rentals, um, you know, and any of that revenue, you know, would show up in, in the community use of schools um, budget in the general f or the general fund, for example, you know, you rent the pool for a, a pool party, you know, that revenue it goes directly back to the general fund to the general fund. okay thank you um I, I was looking at the electric bills for the community center um you know i'm sure with most large buildings it, it costs a lot to keep it operating um i, I just just want to ask a question if we had ever considered or looked at entertaining the possibility i you know how feasible it is i have no idea but at least investigating the opportunity potentially of um maybe you know, subsidizing electricity with solar or something like that. I don't know if conversations like that have ever come up. No, no, good point. Um, you know, re renewable energy, I'm a fan of, you know, we've, we've looked in town, um, you know, at, at different sites. Um, we, we've gone through the community center, I believe twice now where we've gone through and replaced older light fixtures that were, you know, using more energy uh, with, you know, LEDs, uh, we've done that in our parking lot. We've done that in our, our, our building, our shops, things of that nature. Um, but I think of a more town-wide um, approach is, you know, it, it would be nice if we could have, you know, utilize um, uh, solar energy more. And, and I know Abby uh, and others have been working on that effort and we're, we're right there with them. Hopefully we'll be able to- Yeah, six figure electric bill. It'd be nice to get that down if, if at all possible, right? Thank you, Brian. Exactly, exactly. Michael Kennedy, I think I want the floor. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, through you. Hi, Brian, how are you? Good evening. Um, we missed our little meeting we usually have today, I mean, uh, beginning of the year. So I just kind of want to follow up on something that Mim and, and Mike Bono and, and Jen um, reached on a little bit. Um, and I know I asked you if you, you track the hours on, on each facility that you spent on the man hours, which you said you just started to, I think, in January. You know, we have all of last year up to March. Um, we, we do. We've placed everything through um, through March 25th. That's something that we, we, we do. We, we did start to track. OK. So, and that's something we had discussed last year. Do, do you feel you have enough man hours to maintain the parks and the fields? You know, and, and I don't see the parks as much, but I do this, say the, see the fields and we had discussed Leary Park last year. It, it, it is challenging um, to be quite honest with you with seven. Um, as a lot of you know, you know, you don't always have seven. You know, we, we have individuals that are injured, individuals, you know, they're out for whatever reason. You know, right now we have a very competent crew, very loyal crew. Um, but, but we do get, you know, 
requests, you know, and I, and I know Mike for years, you, you volunteered a lot yourself, you know, for co-sponsored groups. You know, we, we have more requests coming in um, the Gardner uh, fields, you know, Gardner Woods fields, you know, can you help us a little bit more? You know, we, we try to encourage them to um, utilize volunteers as best as possible, but sometimes the volunteers for whatever reason aren't there. Um, so I, I do have to say it is a challenge, um, you know, to keep up with, with, with the workload. Um, we're in a very good position right now. Um, I mean, we're working through this you know, pandemic with one maintainer less. Uh, and of course, several are taking time off um, and, and the work is still there. Um, I think it's something we need to look at in the future. Um, you were, were, but I think if, you know, Ryan works a lot with our maintainers, um, you know, we, we try one thing, you know, I'll give him a lot of credit for is, you know, and I have to give the town credit as well is, is, is the type of equipment we're, we're, we're utilizing now, you know, when we replace a piece of equipment, we get equipment that has as many features on it as possible. Uh, so we can do, uh, more work in less time and and we try to do as much as we can in-house our, our contractual spending uh has gone down over the years because we've been able to use in-house staff uh, one example is is the cooperation of the beach project you know we have several departments down there um you know literally saving you know tens of thousands of dollars uh you know to get new restrooms at Waterford Beach Park. You know, I have to thank, you know, Slugman Brule and others on that effort. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's very encouraging to see that. Um, but right now, you know, we're doing the best we can. And, and believe me, we understand, um, you know, the financial, um, you know, concerns in town. And, you know, the crew we have now, hey, you know, we're, we're, we're keeping at it. We're getting things done. So, so that kind of leads me into, you know, my second thing. And I don't know if people realize this. They asked about the fees. I, I was I was involved a lot in youth football, youth baseball, and Babe Ruth. And, and, and I don't think people realize that it, it's kind of a partnership. Yes, it's a lot of volunteers. We raise a lot of money. It does cost a lot. But when we do need something, you guys come down. The money that you give goes right into the league when we, we haven't collected fees yet. It helps us start up the league. It's used for various things, from fields to to uniforms to insurance, whatever we need. It 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 it, it helps us. So my question is to you, like Jen said, that how much you helped her down there. I know how much you helped with the other leagues. Would it be helpful to look at uh, a Leary Park and leasing it to a nonprofit and sharing that so you could use the volunteers? Because what I found when I was down there, we can't go on the field. We can't help you. We can't bring a tractor down to Leary. We can't do anything. We're limited. We would love to help. I've been down at Leary Park to play baseball games where the grass is so thick that the ball can't even get to the infield. And there's 10 parents sitting out there that would go get their trailer and bring their tractor down and, and mow it because they have the day off before the game. So I'd like to work together more as a team. And if there is a way to, to get these fields better, do it together like we do because i'll tell you in the youth sports our football field is raved about the shape it's in and it's not just the volunteers it's park and rec that helps as well the little league fields the babe ruth field i'm not into soccer but the the soccer field i hear is amazing over there so i don't know if it's something we can do but i think it's something we should look into if if you feel that you can't do it alone and, and you need some help no there's our th thank you and you know it's you know, we're always looking at, you know, creative solutions on how to get things done. And I think that's a good conversation to have in the future. Thank you. Dr. Wallace Collins, you have the floor now. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. For those following along in the packets, I'm taking a look now at page 16. And my question is about the fertilizer, synthetic and various blends part. I noticed on here some properties that we're using fertilizer on, Stenger Park, um, Waterford Beach Park, the Duck Pond area. And my concern is kind of twofold. It's kind of a two-part question. The first part is, you know, Stenger Farm Park, the duck area, especially down at the beach, these seem to be kind of grassy fields. 
And I'm kind of wondering why it's necessary that we fertilize these large open grassy fields that aren't regularly mowed and don't need to be regularly mowed. And then the second part of that concern is especially with the duck pond area, but in particular at Waterford Beach Park, it seems like using fertilizer, especially synthetic fertilizer, in watershed areas and down by Alewife Cove could be a pretty environmentally destructive thing to do. So I'm kind of wondering how that fertilizer is used, what's the impact of using it, and why we're using it in those areas. Okay, uh, if, if you don't mind, I'm gonna have uh, Ryan McNamara, the assistant director, um, answer that. Right. Sure, uh, yeah, to answer your question, we have, uh, we stay at least 50 to 100 feet away by uh, codes of any water source, putting down any type of pesticide, anything of that nature. Uh, down at the beach, um, those areas are mowed uh, consistently throughout the year uh, until growth season ends in the winter. So. We will uh, put a fertilization uh, application down there if deemed necessary. In the past, we've had groups down there, use sports groups using the fields down there. Um, and you, you can't just leave a, a, a turf area that's going to be used for sports or activity with just weeds. It does not hold as well as grass. You have to keep it uh, strong in, uh, in the turf, the tufts there. Thank you. Follow up, Mr. Monitor. We do not around the duck pond is more of like the civic triangle area. Not we don't go we don't put anything directly around the duck pond. Follow up. Thank you. Oh, uh, floor is still yours. Thank you. Um, so thank you for your response. Um, that clarifies it. I think that given a few things, the financial situation the town is in, and the fact that a lot of these fields are going to be unused this year, this line item is definitely something to look at. Um, in particular, um, it's definitely something to look at. I don't know where that sentence was going, but I am going to make a motion that we reduce line item 52420, maintenance of property by $5,050. Second. Yeah, I have a motion by Baird, um, seconded by Driscoll to reduce the line item by 5,050, was it Baird? Yes, sir. Thank you. Discussion on the motion? Anybody have any discussion, questions? Discussion, Mr. Moderator. Mr. Bono, the floor is yours. Uh, I, do not, I do not necessarily agree with my colleagues' um, characterization that the, you know, the timing and the lack of use of fields is the correct time to reduce uh, a fertilizer budget. Um, if you are maintaining a turf grass, I think that it is um, crucial that that receives the proper fertilization throughout all the time, whether it's being used or not. Um, I would ask that the uh, Rec and Park Department please comment on their management practices of the turf. Um, I have some more specific questions regarding, um, you know, repairing areas that Mr. Collins is uh, um, concerned about. Uh, more specifically, I, in your management practices, when you comment about it, um, can you please talk about the soil testing that you do? Um, talk about the phosphorus levels in your soil testing, what you do to prevent leaching and runoff into those areas. Um, in your management practices, when you comment on it, please talk about the grass seed that you order and that you put down being a non-native species. Um, Perhaps maybe in the beach park, we should be using native species of turf grasses um, instead of non-native species that need to be mowed and fertilized. Um, I don't agree with the cutting of this budget uh, or this line item. Uh, through you, Mr. Moderator, just, just, just to let you know um, how the process works. Um, we, we do work um, with turf grass grass professionals. Um, the company we work that does our soil tests, and I'll defer to Mr. McNamara in a moment, um, they, they visit us um, several times a year. And I do appreciate your comment. If, if you do, um, you know, miss a season, um, you're going to have a, an issue getting that field playable in that next season. 
um, we, we do actually, I would rather uh, do three applications um, per year, but Ryan, if I'm correct, we, we've, we've cut that down to two applications per year. We cut it down to twos and we leave the clippings to provide the extra, it's supposedly a, a third application technically of nitrogen over the course of the year if you leave the bag clippings. I mean, uh, leave the grass clippings. And, you know, as far as, um, uh, you know, Mr. McNamara has gone through the training, you know, for, for, for the pesticide applications, obviously there are certain areas we're very aware of where we can't put that down. Uh, we use organic where we can. Um, for those of you familiar with organic fertilization, um, you know, it, it is still um, being developed. It, it, it doesn't always work, you know, dependent upon your, your soil conditions um your environmental conditions you know we we also have to look at areas that we don't have irrigation uh as, if you look at leary park you, the only water that park receives is is via mother nature we we have um you know one of the reasons and i, and I give the, the soccer organization credit is you know why they have uh such such good turf grass is they had irrigation for years and they and they fertilized down there um you know same with a lot of our youth sport fields on gardeners wood road i believe all the little league fields are irrigated um in leary park and veterans field are not all those four fields are not irrigated and veterans field i, I mentioned veterans field the only town field that we we operate with irrigation is Diedrich. Um, and I understand that we, we have to make some, you know, these are capital improvement projects we've submitted. And I understand that, you know, they may have to wait a while. I, I completely get that. Um, but we're operating without one of the primary ingredients that you need for, for turf grass management is water when, you, when you're in a drought situation or a low water situation. Now, I, I, you forgive me, you had several questions there on soil. Yeah, may, and may, I'm and sorry, may I follow up with that, Mr. Flaherty? There is uh, research at the University of Florida that suggests that if you don't properly maintain turf grass with the proper amount of nitrogen, that it actually contributes to a greater amount of runoff. Um, I understand that, you know, the concern might be that we're putting fertilizer down um, in a riparian area that we're thinking that that fertilizer is contributing to the runoff. But what we're not understanding or we're not thinking about is actually the organics that are in the soil that is not being held back by fertilized turf grass is actually contributing to the runoff at a greater degree. Now, I don't have the that study to cite here in this meeting, but there are research, there is research out there to suggest that not properly maintaining turf grass would contribute to especially nitrate runoff on the Niantic River, which I live on, to a greater degree. So I, I do not support this. Um, I think that properly maintaining turf grass is essential to um, maintaining uh, environmental practices in the town. No, no good point. And, and as I, I believe Ryan had mentioned too, we you know, we don't bag the grass, you know, we, we do, um, you know, keep the clippings on the field, you know, which help us reduce the actual amount of, of fertilization that we have to put down. Um, and, and Ryan, if, if through you, Mr. Moderator, Ryan would like to expound upon that. Yeah, just real quick. Uh, um, Mike, what we do is we take that soil report, but we also do a saturated paste report. Uh, those two in, in combination will tell us the microbiology of the uh, the nutrients underground. So just because a soil test we pull might say there's so many pounds of nitrogen, it might not be active. Um, and in that case, we would use a different uh, material in order to get those active particles underneath going instead of just keep throwing in additional material that's not being used because it's not uh, interacting or having that exchange with the other nutrients in the ground. So we do do a soil report and a saturated paste. The saturated paste tells us what's active and what's not, um, if that helps at all. So yeah, just with that, um, 
I'm sorry, but you're, you're talking about nitrogen. Typically, soil tests don't show active nitrogen as far as fertility in the soil because our atmosphere is made up primarily of nitrogen. But uh, the phosphorus is, I see in your soil reports, it seems to be particularly high. Um, phosphorus can lead to leaching and runoff, particularly in freshwater and riparian areas, typically not saltwater riparian areas, but I'm clearly not an expert on that. I would have to refer back to my oceanology teacher at Waterford High School for uh, that information. But, um, you know, the, the nitrogen runoff is my concern. So, um, you know, and with the organics, if we're not properly maintaining, we have more organics running into the water. That's a problem. Mike, if you're all set, Temple probably has a flow next. I'm, thank you. It wasn't about grass. Can I ask another question? <laughs> um, <laughs> Brian, we got we got um, a motion on the table, Jen. I know. So Don't can I, when do I ask my question? Go ahead. I just want to know if by the time the beach is done this year, if it should open, is it going to be fully ADA compliant all the way down to the entrance to the beach? Uh, our plan is uh, at, at this point to to have from from the parking lot area. Uh, a, a sidewalk, which would take you from the parking lot to, to the new bridge, and then, you know, by the new bathroom to, to the actual causeway bridge. From that point on, um, we're looking, since it's a sand surface, at a mobile mat, which I'm sure several of you have seen out there, um, surface. And we do have some donations that have been given. We're working on some grants as well. Uh, but through the, the Waterford Beach bath, bathroom project, um, you know, we, we, we will be very soon, uh, you know, you will see accessibility at the beach. Thank you. Do we have any members of the RTM, any other questions, or discussion on the motion on the floor? Yes, Mr. Mos Mr. Moderator, Tim Condon. Tim Conn, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I want to echo Mr. Bono's uh, thoughts. I, I I can't support the the the, the cut. Um, I too have uh, read the the research on uh, soil stabilization, and I I think that by cutting the fertilization, we're we're going to be we're going to end up causing more problems and and chasing it in the future, and end up having to use more chemicals to correct what we, you know, uh, didn't put down in this season, uh, missing a pre-emergent uh, time period is going to lead to weeds and, and introducing all kinds of uh, possible disease and everything else into our turfs. Uh, you know, these are our parks are heavy, heavily used fields, something the public uh, uses heavily. And, and we do have um, good solid turfs and I don't want to see that, you know, wasted, uh, by missing a, a few uh, applications and i'm glad to hear that we're using the grass clippings as one of our nitrogen applications and and i uh, applaud them for looking into this and I, i'm glad we're using organics um i just have one question uh very quickly is it are we using liquids or are we using solids when we when we're doing our applications uh yes th thank you for that um through you, Ms. Roderick, it's all granular. Except for any Roundup, that's a spray, but that's a no, no. Only in areas where it's allowed. No. Yeah. You all set, Tim? Yes, thank you very much. Mr. Collins, I think you had your hand up again. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I absolutely agree with Mr. Bono's assessment of the necessity of maintaining turf grass. And some of the properties listed under fertilizer are turf grass, like the sports fields, which absolutely should have a regular application of pest, uh, not pesticides, I'm sorry, fertilizer. Um, but some of them are not. And the properties I specifically mentioned down by the beach area, the field near Stenger, those are not turf in the sense that they're not sports fields to be played upon. Those are just grass fields. And that's why I've only cut half of that fertilizer line item. There are, let me rephrase that, proposed cutting half of the fertilizer line item. In response to the weeds and the soil health, um, I'm not touching pesticides. Those are sometimes necessary, and we're not really talking about introducing weeds or 
unhealthy aspects into the soil. We're really just talking about fields that are probably not going to be used this year. And we're also not talking about the turf fields. We're talking about these grassy areas that are probably not going to see any use over this summer. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Mr. Collins, just for the record, for the clerk, I believe the motion to subtract the $5,000 is 52420 millions of properties. Correct. And it's 5050 correct? Correct. OK, thank you. Any additional questions or discussion on the motion? Um, I have a question. Greg. Greg, you got the floor. Brian, you're you're not responsible in any way. I guess who's responsible for fertilizing the turf fields at the schools? Um, we do we do that as well, but that's not included in this line item. Where would that line item come from to fertilize the turf at the school field? You you'll find it on actually the last page of the five two four twenty. So it doesn't come out of the education budget to fertilize. Pages 22 and 23. Correct. It doesn't come out of the education budget. It comes out of the town. Is that a rec budget to fertilize the turf? That's field. correct. Okay. Thank you. Rich Muckle's next. Rich Muckle, you got the floor. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, the, the question for the assistant director How often? And generally speaking, what areas are tested where soil analysis are done? Sure. The, uh, the areas that we test uh, are usually dependent, but most of them are sports fields, uh, unless you're looking at the areas like that we, we would uh, look around the center of town, if there was any issues there, if we happen to notice something, uh, infestation of grubs, whether it be uh, dandelions or a pre-emerger we may have to hit, um, we will pull soils wherever we feel our priorities are. We don't get to pull soils everywhere every year. Um, sometimes because we'll, we do a saturated paste, if we're not getting everything right, we only have so much budgeted for it. Follow up, Mr. Moderator? Yes, Mr. McCook, go ahead. Uh, the uh, areas that around the upper parking lots at the high school. How are those treated? Um, and uh, what specifically or, or generally what are the tests done? How often? What is he saying? Upper parking lot areas at the high school, how are they treated? Uh, the it? upper parking lot areas at the high school are typically not treated. I mean, we don't, we can, the cars are already there by the time we're trying to get in. So there's usually not a lot of treatments on the parking lot islands. Along Ring Road, we will put in erosion control mats and try to reseed. We've been doing that the last two years uh, as there was a ton of ivy and uh, junipers that were entangled and dying out through that hillside. So right now, the best bet we've got from talking with Yukon Ag and a couple of different professors is seeds, just pound it with seed until it recovers water and go from there. Um, the fertilization at the high school is typically all of the fields. Uh, and it, we do do some uh, seeding in the front where the electronic scroll is, where a lot of the high traffic areas are. Um, but fertilization will be uh, dependent on the soil test and we'll pull it, uh, areas that are not high traffic, probably every other. Thank and you. those are to everything at the schools are organic except for the high school. Thank you again. Mike Bono's next. Mike Bono, the floor is yours next. He's muted. Mike Bono, the floor is yours. Yeah, I'm going to lower his hand. Will my colleague consider a um, friendly amendment to his motion on the same line item for a um, cut for in the amount of $2,610 for the bark mulch line item, um, being that we in town utilize a tub grinder at our public workstation to have access to free mulch. We don't certainly don't need to be buying mulch at $29 a yard. Yes, I accept the friendly amendment. 
No, um, so you accept the friendly amendment to reduce it down to 2,610? Yes. Okay. Increase it. I'm sorry, the new, the, so I'm sorry, Mr. Collins, your original cut, I, I asked that you make that cut now $2,610 for the same light item that was the bark mulch quote. That's on page 17. For line item 52420, maintenance of property? Yeah, if you go on page 17, you're looking on page 16, right? Fertilizer costs? I'm on 17. Arc mulch is in the amount subtotal amount of two thousand six hundred and ten dollars. Are you asking to increase the cut by that amount? No, I want to reduce your cut to that amount, two thousand six hundred and ten dollars. Okay. Yes, I accept your friendly amendment. Do I have to get an agreement from Driscoll? Uh, I've got it. Just about, yeah. Just give me a minute. So. Sure. So, so the new cut, it, um, does uh, Driscoll need to uh, to accept the friendly amendment? Mrs. Driscoll, do you accept the friendly amendment? I did, but you were talking. Thank you. Sorry. So the new sure. the new total would be two thousand four hundred and forty forty dollars. To line item fifty-two four twenty, is that correct, there? Did you say that number once more? It's going to be two thousand four hundred and forty dollars to line item fifty-two four twenty. Yes, I think that's the correct amount. Okay, you can ask for a roll call vote if you like. I'm confused. We'll take it to roll call vote unless I miss any questions. I don't think that is the correct amount. Yeah, I think Mr. Bono was calling for $2,610 to be cut. 2610 That's correct. correct. Yeah, 2610 Don't trust me with math. 2610 is fine. Yeah, I keep coming out with the 5050 subtract 2610 and we've got $2,440. Kim, are you available to confirm that? Yeah, uh, Dave, I'm sorry. I was not necessarily doing the math. I was just making the new cut total 2610 Okay, gotcha. So the new total, 2610 Bear, are you in agreement with that? Yes. Sue, are you in agreement with that? Yes. Okay. okay. Moderator, can we please have the finance director please just do a confirmation as well? She's on the line. Yes, that's correct. To a okay. new total for that line is 147,523. Thank you, David. One forty-seven five twenty-three. Kim? Yes, correct. And voting on the cut. We're voting on the cut. The wrong, the wrong clerk will take a roll call vote, please. Mr. Atanasio. Yes. Mr. Bono. No. What? Mr. Shelley. I'm so I'm sorry. I meant no. I mean, I yes, yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> Mr. Shelley. Beard almost fell over. Oh, now you're confusing me. No. Wait a minute. I'm sorry. I voted yes to the cut. I'm sorry, Mr. Campo. Okay, so Bono's yes. Ms. Brashali? No. Ms. Cairns? Yes. Mr. Condon? Yes. Mr. Denbeck? I'm Ms. Driscoll? Yes. Mr. Elsie? Yes. Ms. Mr. Fiervanti? Yes. Ms. Burry Wagner? Yes. Mr. Gauthier? Yes. Mr. Goldstein? Yes. Ms. Cole?
I didn't hear you, Mrs. Cole. I'll come back to you. Mr. Lurch. Yes. Ms. Bativier. Yes. Mr. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Muckle. Yes. Mr. O'Leary. Yes. Mr. Olinsu. Yes. Ms. Ritchie. Yes. Mr. Rochetti. Yes. Ms. Stewart Gelinas. Yes. Did Mr. Swanson come back into the room? Did he enter? Nope. Mr. Welch Collins. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Any other questions or comments on the recreational parks budget? Uh, Ms. Furry Wagner. Through you, Mr. Moderator, I would like to um, propose a cut um, from overtime of $5,000. So that would be line. Five one eight one zero. Second. Five one. I've got a um, motion by Miss Furry Wagner, seconded by Welch Collins, of a cut of five thousand dollars to line five one eight one zero. Over time. Any question or discussion? I'd just like to make one comment, Mrs. Wagner. The great idea you had early in the conversation, changing the work week or the work or the workers, but that's something that's got me negotiating the contract. And that's something that I hope someone remembers tomorrow night when the HR director is here and her budget is up. She's the one to be negotiating those contracts, not mine. So that's something they got to change the contract. Okay, and through you, Mr. Moderator, just just to be clear, we, we did already make a reduction in the overtime line item budget before you know, this presentation, just to make sure we're on record. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Driscoll, you asking for the floor? No, I didn't. No, I didn't raise my hand. So we have a motion, no discussion. Any other discussion? Now we'll take it to roll call vote. Mr. Atanasi. Yes. Mr. Bono. Yes. Mr. Bono, I didn't hear you. Yes. Ms. Prashali. No. Ms. Prashali? No. Ms. Cairns? Yes. Mr. Condon? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Dembeck? I'm staying. Ms. Driscoll? Yes. Mr. Elsie? No. no. Mr. Fiervanti? No. Ms. Furry Wagner? Yes. Mr. Gauthier. No. Mr. Goldstein. Yes. Ms. Cole. Uh, no. Mr. Lurch. Yes. Ms. Bativier. Yes. yes. Mr. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Muckle. Yes. Mr. O'Leary. Yes. Mr. Olinsu. Yes. Ms. Ritchie. No. Mr. Rochetti. Yes. Ms. Stewart Gelinas. Yes. Mr. Swanson. Oh, sorry. Mr. Welch Collins. Yes. Sixteen to six with one abstention. Motion passes. Motion passes 16 to 6, one abstention. Any other discussion on the recreational box budget? Um, Nim Wagner still has her hand up. I don't know if she has a question. No. She's good. 
I think Susan Mr. Susan had a hand up. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, now I do have a question. I had to wait until after the vote. Uh, confirm with the finance director that we should make a com uh, a related cut under FICA. And I'm not sure whether fringe benefits would be touched by that. Yes, we will need to. Could I could I beg you to do the math for me? You didn't do that in your head, Sue, real quick? $383. Okay. Uh, and and no impact on fringe benefits? Um no. Okay. Uh thank you very much. And yep. no, I did not do the math in my head. Um <laughs> Uh, I have lost. I lost that ability sometime yesterday. Um, so, uh, therefore, then I move that we reduce uh, line item FICA five one nine two zero by three hundred and eighty three dollars. Second. Who seconded it? Jalon Stewart. Thank you. Motion by a second. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Anybody involved? No. Good. I'll stay. Mr. Moderator, could we get the updated amounts for those and the subtotal? Can we get time? Could you get those to us? The new subtotal for personnel cost is one million one thirty four thousand eight hundred forty seven. The new subtotal for services three hundred and one thousand nine hundred ninety nine for a grand budget total of one million five hundred eleven six one five. Any other discussion on the recreation park budget? Any additional discussion on the recreation of Fox Pavilion budget for one million five eleven to six one five? Yes, Mr. Marlin. I have a question. Ask a question. Is there any way to tell me what percentage of that budget was just cut? I think it's being worked on just MI. Thank you. I think like 0.5% maybe. So 0.5% and they had already come in with a 0% increase, correct? That's a firm. The budget was 0% increase when they came in. All right. Thank you. On the new total, I think we can just do. Yeah.
Kim, do you have a percentage up by chance? about 0.5%. Thank you very much. If no one has any objection, we'll take the recreational parks budget, the new budget, revised total 1,511,666 in a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? And I'll abstain. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Next budget before us tonight, 10146, community use of schools for $86,126. <laughs> Questions, discussion. Susan Driscoll, you want the floor? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, here, let me lower my hand. Um, I'm not sure who I'm asking, but uh, since Brian, uh, Brian had been asked a question about uh, fees for events at schools, and he said that those fees were put into this budget, community use of schools, which is in its final phase out. I mean, next year it will be down to zero as we've worked out this accounting magic over three years. So my question is, where would those fees, theoretically revenue, um, go next year? Go right on, on YouTube. Oh, yeah, here. I don't care. Is that something you can help us try to answer? I'm looking at it. Um, give me a sec. Yeah. Oh, no, I keep you uh, keep me in the corner. Where'd you go? There's like too many people talking. But usually you're you're uh, you're over here on, on where they see it, but this is the uh, this is the, the live YouTube stream. Last year cool. the agreement. Yeah, it, it keeps people. There's probably three pages, huh? five by twenty five, um, and the active people, or if they raise their hand, yeah. they get moved over. People that are literally doing absolutely nothing. That looks good. Which yeah. who? Yeah, looks good. Oh, Danielle looks good. Yeah. Look good, look good. You look good. I wouldn't want to give you a wrong answer. I'd want to do a little bit more research to answer that correctly. Yeah, sure. um, I totally understand because it's one of the more confusing things and I <laughs> used to understand it. But uh, as you said, I just went back and looked and I think I found the answer kind of backwards, like this whole community use of school phase out is. And that says that uh, starting with fiscal year 2022, um, the Board of Education shall report the costs associated with the use of skill, school facilities um, for community purposes. So the Board of Ed will start reporting that again in their budget, which makes it sound like rep, uh, park, Rec and Parks will be free, I guess, um, to take those fees and report them as revenue and they go into the general fund. There's that way, yes. That's my theory. The first glance of the contract, I agree yeah. with that, but I'd want to look at it more closely before we confirmed. No, that's right. You know what? I will not hold you to an answer. I'm sure everyone could wait till some other time. Okay. Any additional question on the community use of schools? I understand this is the last year. Next year, there will be no line, there will be no budget for community use of schools. It'll be somehow absorbed in the Board of Education budget. 
No additional questions. We'll take it to a vote. 86,326 dollars. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone aye. abstain? The aye is having it's unanimous. Thank you. <clears throat> Next item on the agenda is the uh, 10123 fire service. Is it? Yep. On three million. $101,562. I think Ms. Bruce Miller was logged on earlier. Bruce, are you available? Yes. Right, Bruce Miller, Director of Fire Service, uh, is available. Bruce, you want to send any opening statements? Well, um, we, you know, with the current situation in our world going 180 on us in the past few months, um, you know, this budget really wasn't prepared, you know, for this situation. So uh, any kind of introduction will kind of, I can forego and we can get right to the questions to save some time. Thank you, Bruce. On a personal cost for the upcoming year, you have $1,866,238. Any questions from member of the RTM? Uh, Susan Driscoll, you got the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I, I did have, if I could just preface with a, a quick question, it was about part of the intro material that Bruce provided. I mean, it's connected to personnel. It was on page nine, um, the mutual aid given reports. I was wondering if you know, later on, not tonight, you could break out for the emergency uh, calls and everything, uh, which ones were, were um, WAS and which ones were, you know, paid employees and which ones were volunteers. Sure, I'll, I'll get somebody to work on that. Okay, thank you. All right, so my, my actual first question was in overtime. And I apologize, because I think I dropped my pile. So my first note was overtime line and personnel costs. The um, actual cost to date as of 422 uh, is $166,000 and change. Um, what was budgeted was 25,000. So obviously I'm looking at quite the budget overage. So I know that um, first responders are experiencing some increases in, specs, in expenses since the pandemic, but this all appeared to have happened earlier. So I'm just trying to figure out, you know, cause last year we hired two new firefighters that weren't covered by the budget last year. They were to help cover shortages in coverage. Um, I don't know if it's because we had to wait for the, them to get trained, if there were any other events or, you know, what was the driver for it to be so high? Well, the, one of the main reasons was we were expecting um, the, the Waterford Ambulance staffing to kind of take place a little quicker and, and our personnel not be on as many calls. And that didn't happen as quickly as we thought it was going to. Um, so we were still, you know, manning those. And, um, you know, so it we had to stay at our, at our full manpower as much as possible. We, you know, we couldn't really hold off on letting any shifts go empty or anything. Um, exactly. Okay, I understand. Thank you. And um, so I guess, so you're comfortable with only requesting 59,000 then because you see that as a one-time event? Yes, they, you know, um, the ambulance service has just recently put um, a second ambulance crew on. Uh, they, they're staffing one 24 seven. They have another one on days now. Um, they realize there's still some shortages in, in that coverage, but, um, you know, they're, they're going to work to, to deal with that. So, um, you know, our, you know, once we get through this pandemic, you know, hopefully our, our stuff will get back to our normal staff and then we should be able to, to get through with that requested amount. Okay. I will, um, I will yield because there's other hands up and then I can just come back. Mr. Wagner, the floor is yours. 
Um, I'm, I'm a newbie at, um, at this, um, Mr. Miller, so excuse me. So you're saying that we went into the overtime because of um, the Waterford Ambulance couldn't cover all your calls? Right. We, we um, are anticipating reducing some of our, our daytime staff and at various locations, uh -huh. um, you know, with their staffing in place. And that didn't happen quick enough. So we were still had, we still had our, um, those additional shifts out there. So that's why we, we had so much, um, you know, coverage we had to fill. So when those ambulance drives go out and, and you charge, should we see a revenue come back from those uh, ambulance runs? We, we don't charge water for the ambulance service charges. The, the fire department doesn't see any, any funds from that. Even if it's the fire department that does the run. Right. The, the current situ, uh, current, um, situation right now is we're still through the end of this fiscal year um, in the agreement where the ambulance service is paying a monthly fee to the town for manpower but that um, the contract was recently signed it goes into effect July 1 and they're they're pro um, they're not going to be paying for the manpower for the ambulances itself we'll be responding in fire fire apparatus as opposed to ambulances the ambulance service will, will man the ambulances okay so, so this is again a one-time year. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Member Shelley, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Hi, Bruce. Um, just to reiterate, because I think a lot of the community doesn't understand the ambulance is its own service, independent of the fire service. Correct. Correct. They Correct. are not paid for by the taxpayers. Correct. Correct. And my other question was, and I haven't uh, looked at this really closely, but I know that you guys were short on PPEs. Do you have enough in your budget to purchase PPEs for your guys um, now? Because I think you're going to be using those for a while. Well, through through the um, current situation, um, the donations with the state, donations from businesses and so forth, and what we you know what we could afford through the budget, we have a supply. Um, you know, this isn't to us is not going to be the flip of a switch and be turned off. You know, we're going to be in this situation, I, you know, for years, um, you know, from our standpoint, you know, every patient we encounter is, is, you know, they're going to get more protection than they've ever had in the past. So, um, you know, it's going to take a little bit of reprioritizing my budget with equipment, you know, because now we're going to have to look at medical equipment, medical supplies and PPE. But, you know, for the current situation we're in, you know, we have a supply to last us, you know, for a while. Jen, I think you're muted still. Are you trying to speak? No, I just gave him a thumbs up. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure he had enough money to keep his staff safe because this wasn't planned for when he made this budget. And it's something they can't go short on when they have to um, aid the ambulance on a call, they ha might ha have to go into a house. They might have to go into a house to help with the CO detection and wear their PPE. So they need to have enough money to buy this stuff. That's the same. Thank you. As the, um, as the uh, public protection safety is going to need. Any additional question on the personal cost of the fire service budget? Hey, Tim, Tim Condon Tom. has a question. Go to Tim. Tim, you got the floor. Uh, thank you. I, I think this belongs under personnel, and it's really just a comment, and it just goes back to a conversation that uh, Bruce and I have had, and that is I would just ask that, you know, as we move forward uh, with the economic climate, if we can, you know, Bruce, if you can investigate uh, what other communities are doing with the in the marshal's office as far as recuperating costs for plan review and inspections, I know uh, a lot of people on the RTM would greatly appreciate that investigation. Yes. Um, you know, it was it was looked at numerous years ago, um, but it was quite a while ago when a lot of other towns started to do it. And 
at that point in time. I'm not sure why the town we decided not to do it, but um, I will get that out and we'll we'll take another hard look at it. Thank you. Additional questions on personal budget or fire service budget? Next part of the budget is under uh, services. Total 936944 dollars. Any questions? Susan <laughs> just got the floor. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, Bruce, uh, under insurance, I'm looking at page 38. Well, insurance, your year to the um, year to date. I think we are pushing the requested amount, but I noticed that you are asking for less this year than you did last year. However, the backup says the insurance provider gave you a 5% increase for the upcoming year. So why why did we go with a lower number? What, Not that I don't like lower numbers. <laughs> no, what, what happened there was um, in the prior years, the, the ambulance service, their insurance was part of that big package. So we would pay it in, in total, and then they would reimburse us for their portion of it. Um, probably the first quarter into the year, they got into their own insurance. We did get a little bit of a rebate, but some of the policy, because it's umbrella coverages and stuff, a lot of the administrative fees kind of got lost in there, and we ended up not getting any refund off of those. So the number next year should be down, um, you know, based on their estimate, it should be down what we budgeted. Okay. Well, it was just, it was yeah. another one of those transition things that happened right in mid season. Yeah. That's good. Um, that's it. Any additional questions on the uh, services section on the fire service budget? No question on that. We're going to material and supplies. Two hundred thirty-eight thousand eight hundred eighty-eight dollars. Questions. Susan Driscoll. Susan Driscoll. Susan, do you want the floor? Yes. I'm sorry. I did not realize I was muted again already. Um. I thought it would take longer to get down that far. Um, supplies, just uh, a quick question on the consumables on page 57. Um, it's used for food and refreshments for firefighters during long-term incidents and training sessions. So um, I'm wondering how many long-term incidents we had, you know, what qualifies as a long-term incident? Because I assume it's, you know, more than a few hours or a day? Well, it's, you know, sometimes they'll get caught out at a, you know, like a hazmat type thing where they have to wait, you know, multiple hours. Um, some of it has to do also with um, last year, we had a little bit of a, a heat wave where uh, we had a couple days, it was really hot. So we ended up having to, you know, put some Gatorade and some stuff on some trucks. So it's used for that type of stuff. It's not just a food thing. It's, it's a kind of almost a rehab for some of our guys. Okay. No, that's, so, a I mean, I can, I can, Take a look back and that, get the number of times that we did it and, and get you that information. Um, yeah, I, I think my question more wasn't, I'm all for Gatorade in July, yeah. you yeah. know, or even in the winter when they're in their gear. Yeah. Um, I, I think it was just the long-term incidents. You know, I, I was trying to, I imagine, well, now we have the pandemic, but I imagine like, you know, massive blizzard and, you know, they have to be, everybody has to be on call for, several days or trapped in the firehouse whatever right we yeah. you know we would we would definitely you know supply food then but also um you know they they get some calls that they're they're tied up for multiple hours so they're you know, they brought refreshments on scene for some of that okay i was just looking for estimates you know that you're using your projections because I, I was afraid i was oblivious to big events happening in town yeah no the, i mean the number that that you have there is just pretty much based on history you know we, we look at a three-year history, a five-year history, sometimes a 10-year history, and that number kind of stays in that ballpark. So that's how it, it stayed there. 
Great, thank I mean, you. I can from 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 now on, I can actually kind of summarize by year how many events were there that we utilized it. If that'll help. Okay, thank you. Sally Ritchie's next. Sally uh, Ritchie, you got the floor. Good evening, Bruce. Just mm -hmm. a quick question. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, can you tell me about the volunteer responder awards? that that money um is there so that the chiefs can um you know can kind of reward their their personnel um you know it, it's really not like plaques and things like that it's more um they like to reward the more active guys with with types of you know whether it be a fire department t-shirt um you know gloves that they can you know firefighting gloves you know things that they actually do need but they you know they can reward them at their banquets with you know, some type of award like that. So we okay. try to keep it more material stuff as opposed to plaques and trophies and things like that. Yeah, I like that. Um, I remember being um, admonished though by uh, George Peteros when we said we had volunteer recognition dinners, um, which we ran out of special revenue, not out of the budgeted amount. Yeah. And um, we would give them like a little ornament that we had made ourselves and he said well the cost should be de minimis like a couple of bucks and i'm now wondering where he got that from or were we having to do something that other departments didn't have to well i mean you know some of these things like i said if they if you use you know um you know firefighting gloves or hoods or things like that i mean some of those like a, a pair of firefighting gloves runs anywhere from 85 to like 125 dollars. so they, but it's not you know it's not cheap stuff that you run the home depot and grab so right you know those but are then a they're more costly using, but then they're using that in their job as a volunteer fire. yes yes okay thank you yeah. all right why don't we got got the floor Yes, thank you. Real quick, um, th through you, Mr. Moderator, uh, Mr. Miller, um, I was just curious, um, under your, like, f fuels and lubricants, that um, uh, 53090, um, did that include things such as, like, oil change of apparatus and uh, general maintenance cost of uh, uh, firefighting uh, equipment? The, um, the actual oil changes and so forth would be under the... Um apparatus repairs okay um i was just curious if the waterford um if the fire service utilizes oil sampling on their equipment and their rigs um not i like private like construction companies would use such a method to uh stretch out oil change and maintenance intervals as a cost saving measure i'm not necessarily advocating for that but they would also use it to start to um identify a premature failure and being that you are um you know maintain a constant state of readiness. I was just curious if you utilize oil sampling as part of your um, standard maintenance interval to uh, try to identify equipment and problems before they happen. In other words, thank you. We have before, but um, you know, now we're, we're almost on an annual schedule where we're, you know, we're getting stuff out in July and August to, you know, to, to service it. Um, and, you know, unless we see any, any types of issues, you know, we haven't, really go on in that route i mean we do test our diesel fuel and and that but we haven't done any oil sampling lately but there's something for us to look into no thank you very much sir any additional questions on material supplies yes, sir. now we're going to equipment equipment sub call fifty nine thousand five hundred dollars questions no driscoll I'm sorry, Mr. Moderator. I, I didn't realize this was still in supplies. Um, my question is on uh, page 60, the protective turnout gear. Um, Bruce, I appreciate that this year that you gave us a little more detail, um, you know, allocating, almost said outfits, and that's not right, but allocating by firehouse. Uh, you know where the expenses went can can you tell us you know uh, how many of these 
in your projections are, are you know, replacement gear for, you know, used, worn out, you know, there were so many calls, <coughs> and how many might be like new outfits for new volunteers? If you've um, done those projections? In general, that this is all replacement, um, you know, a, a set of protective gear, they say should last 10 years, um, you know, on the average member, we can get 10 years out of a set on some of our more active people. We're, we're probably more like seven, eight years into it. But all of that gear you see is is replacement gear. So our more active guys, um, you know, we'll we'll get them new stuff more frequently and we'll use that, you know, the, the use gear for, for new members coming in until they're trained and so forth. And then yeah. once they're trained, then we'll, you know, and that the gear they get assigned reaches their limit, then we'll get new stuff for them. Okay. So we do keep our more active guys, our more qualified guys with the, with the newer stuff. Any additional questions on material and supplies or equipment? No additional <laughs> questions. Huh? Susan Driscoll, got your hand up. Susan, got your hand up? No, sorry, forgot to take it down because I was busy hitting my microphone. <clears throat> Understand. Thing none, the total fire service budget for 20, 2021. Three million one hundred one thousand five hundred sixty-two dollars. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? The ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please stay safe. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is one hundred one hundred one Board of Selectmen. Total budget for next year, $1,326. Broken down as follows. Personnel cost, $94,527. Any questions? Susan Driscoll. Through you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Hi, Rob. I figured he should be annoyed by me as as much as anybody. Um, in the services line, because I'm jumping right ahead, because we seem to be uh, professional fees. There's no description in the backup, and uh, I believe uh, the fees are legal fees for the town attorney, and and the ones that are most visible to us are stuck in the legal department. So I was just looking for a few examples. Sure. I could tell you right off the bat before Rob gets on to uh, Mr. Sheehan had asked me, you know, what do you plan on using this for? And I, I really told him I wasn't sure a brand new to the job uh, before I came in. Someone was in this job for 14 years and uh, I wouldn't even begin to tell you um, what I need help with, where I need professional services when I'm going to prioritize as a town because I'm more in the social media IT world of communication. Um, so I did explain that to, to uh, one of the board of finance members in transparency to him because I just wasn't sure. There's a lot of things I need to uh, attend. There's conferences that I need to learn from. And I just didn't know which ones to put down that were listed beforehand. Um, so in terms of if I don't spend that money, I will not spend that money and it will go back to the general fund. I can assure you of that. But Rob Avina does have an example of, of what professional fees were used for for this year. Thank you. Hi everybody, Rob Avina. Um, that's the line we use uh, basically for our appraisals and our appraiser fees. Um, as you can see, um, some years it's heavier than others. Um, I'm actually a little concerned about the amount, but we'll work, uh, we'll work through that. Uh, often if we need appraisers for, um, my litigation involving tax appeals, or if, uh, we are looking to acquire any properties, uh, we need competitive, uh, appraisals pretty quickly. 
uh, we often go to that line item. Um, it's not actually in my legal budget at all to pay, to pay, to pay for other professional fees. Um, so traditionally, uh, that's the line item that we look to. Certainly. Thank you, Rob. No, I, I know you didn't pay professional fees. I just meant, you know, lawyers get professional fees. Those, those were all allocated there. And so I wanted to find out what was here. Yeah. Um, the appraisers is good. Rob's answer, that was fine. Don't worry, Rob. <laughs> Not always on attack. Just <laughs> trying to understand what's going on. Uh, I think it's good. You know that that you thought ahead because i know you're new however that being said it sounds like rob already laid claim to your entire budget so you might want to find some really good chat groups of first time first selectmen or something No further questions. We're going to services. Section of budget five thousand six hundred seventy-five dollars. No questions. No question. Material supplies one thousand one hundred eighteen dollars. No For a total budget of two hundred one thousand three hundred twenty dollars. All in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone abstain? The ayes have it. Yeah. Next budget for this evening, 10130 Public Works. Total budget, $4,689,207. I think the Public Works Director, I think, is available. Mr. Gary Snyder? Yes, I am. I'm here. Okay, did you want to say any opening comments or statements? Uh, no, I would, I would rather get into uh, questions and answers. That's usually better. Uh, it's getting late. Uh, so I'd, I'm, I'm here with uh, my uh, office coordinator, Sandy, in the back. Uh, I've been six months on the job, but um, the budget was set up with her and me. So uh, I'm ready for the questions. Who's addressing that question? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I can't believe I am I'm beating everybody to this click with my arthritis. Um, Gary, you know, welcome. I know you've got a thousand bazillion budgets in your history. I remember that from before, but this is your first official RTM budget hearing. So first, I just want to say um, I noticed uh, you've had to deal with some new uh, mandates from the state taking on some new expenses and still we're holding this budget tight so I appreciate appreciate the effort I know other area other places might call them unfunded mandates but they're all unfunded mandates you know so, um, I do appreciate it especially like the ms4 um, but I also wanted to acknowledge because I had heard things about this in in uh, committee meetings last year from our SCARA representative and you mentioned it in your intro um, that, you know, our subsidies, uh, SCARA has been very generous about providing two different subsidies for us that have helped offset our trash disposal, recycling, all that. And because of world events before the pandemic, mostly related to China won't buy our plastic anymore, they had given you a heads up that they were going to have to cease those subsidies. So I know you, that this was prepared several months ago. I wondered if you had any clearer idea of where SCARA might be headed there. Uh, really, there's uh, two parts of SCARA, uh, well, really three parts that the, that the authority provides to the town. So let's go with the first one. They uh, do provide a lot of services to the transfer station, uh -huh. which is the, uh, the propane tanks, the tires, um, mm -hmm. the program. Uh, so, so SCARA does that. And they also do a huge amount of grinding and brush. Uh, creates those uh, either a single grind or double grind for wood chips. On the second portion then is the MSW, that's the uh, our garbage uh, that gets uh, burned to the incinerator. Ascara uh, had uh, worked for uh, three or four years negotiating a new contract that's good for 10 years and all of our waste uh, uh, will be directed to go to Lisbon as of January 1 of, of next year. 
uh, at a really uh, good uh, uh, rate. This was $69 a ton. Now, SCARA does rebate back to the towns uh, $10 for that, so they charge the towns $58 a ton. That $69 a ton is one of the lowest in the state. The Hartford area is looking at going to $110 a ton for MSW. So we have secured, as, as, as a member of SCARA, the board, a location that is close to us uh, for 10 years at a good fee. What is the recyclables? Uh, they go to Willimantic Waste. It was the a contract that we had negotiated with them for the first three, 31 months. It is $70 a ton. After that, we hope the markets will balance itself out and there'll be some uh, um, uh, revenues from the, from the recyclables. They will be worth something and then we could gain some of that money back. But right now, Scarif for this upcoming fiscal year has uh, in their budget, uh, we'll be paying for the uh, the disposal of the, of the recyclables up at Willimantic Waste. And that's still for the whole region of a tune of about $1.1 million. Uh -huh. So for this budget, we're set. It's the next year's budget where we don't know uh, uh, the board doesn't know which way uh, they'll be going, whether there'll be a, a fee for that, whether the markets will come back up a little bit. They were coming back up a little bit before COVID-19, and now they kind of bottom out again. So uh, yeah. what is the waste generation? The best thing is to use less, uh, but it's stable now. <clears throat> we do have a place to take it. We're not as, uh, we are better off than anyone else in the state of Connecticut in this region for disposable waste. Yeah. Thank you. An additional question, the personal cost of the public works budget, which is $2,398,985. Uh, no additional questions on personnel. We'll go on to services. What? That's a total of $1,267,687. No question, that section of the budget, we're going to materials and supplies, $682,425. Mike Bono, we got the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, <clears throat> uh, I asked the same question of the uh, fire service director. I, ask the same of uh, you and your materials and supplies. Um, do you currently or have thought about using an oil sampling um, uh, service to inform you on preventative maintenance tasks or um, give, provide you the ability to stretch out uh, drain intervals um, in certain oil changes of equipment? I know heavy equipment is gallons and gallons of uh, lubricating oils. Um, which would be a big savings and also, uh, you know, take that waste oil out of the, uh, you know, potentially having to be um, recycled. So it's better for the environment, the further we can stretch drain intervals if we're able to. So I was just curious if you uh, use that or could utilize that in the future. Thank you. We do not do it now. Uh, uh, as I go through uh, the public works operations here, there's certain areas uh, I'm going to be highlighting, and that's one of them. In my previous job, we did use that. We did take a look at our heavy equipment, the ones that cost $100,000, dollars $300,000, and we did that analysis because, as, as you had said, it will do a couple things. One is that oil change, or we change your oil at the right interval, too long, too short, but also find out if that engine is wearing uh, if it's something's going wrong in that engine, if you're picking up metals and everything else, and you can uh, do a easier repair instead of a replacement. So uh, that's what we will be going to, but we're not doing it now. Thank you, sir. Next budget section of the budget is equipment, $19,412. Improvements, town aid, road improvements, $320,698. Question? No. 
There was a dress code. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, Gary, I was trying to find the answer myself in uh, the year-to-date actuals that Kim was kind enough to provide. And I got lost in the sea of there's debits in their credits and everything. So I wanted to confirm because I could not find a matching number. Um, so we are, we anticipated $320,698 in state aid for town repairs, right, this year? Uh, correct. That's the money that flows from the state in their TAR programs, you know, town aid rolls. Yes. Flows or trickles down, whatever. <laughs> but um, so, so uh, the actual expenditure, so have we received 212000 from the state so far this year? Or I, I think Kim, Kim is on the Zoom. I, I, I do believe we have received the entire amount of money. The whole thing. But I would like Kim to answer that. That's correct. We have received the full amount for our roads. Excellent. Thank you. That's it. Thanks. Any additional questions on the public works budget? No one else has a question. Public total public works budget for this coming year, four million six hundred eighty nine thousand two hundred seven dollars. All in favor, say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Anybody abstain? Thank you. The ayes have it. Before we recess, the town clerk, I think you all received copies in the on your email, but just for the record, he just wants to acknowledge. Seven letters received today. Just want to read off the names and addresses. Dave, you got the floor. I just want to let the public be aware that today the um, the RTM did receive eight comments um, from the public, and they were all posted on the website. The names of the people who um, um, who submitted comments was Linda Braille, Linda Braley of Windward Way, Carol Batch of Savvy Ave. Erica Bassett, Laura McHugh, EJ McHugh, Tammy Hullivan, Cheryl Morosky, and Kim Pedeswa. Those are all um, posted on the website um, for view by any of the public. More did come in after the meeting started tonight. Those will be all acknowledged tomorrow and they will be sent out to all the RTM members as well as put on the website for view. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your time tonight. And at this time, it's about 8.57. We'll uh, recess till tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.